Armstrong. What is going on, everybody? Welcome into the next episode of my off-season deep dive series, as today we reveal the number 25 team in my power rankings heading into next season with the Los Angeles Chargers. Probably the first team that I do feel a little bit lower on, especially when you look at their Super Bowl odds. They're like 15th in Super Bowl odds, so certainly a good bit lower there. So I guess I have some splaining to do in this episode. It is a team that I see a lot of holes in still that we'll get into here. But obviously some optimism anytime you have a quarterback like Justin Herbert and a head coach like Harbaugh coming in too. So a lot of fun stuff to talk about here. Before we do get started, if you've been enjoying the series or if you enjoy the video, if you could take just a second to hit that like button, it's a free and easy little thing that actually really supports my channel, supports this series. I really appreciate it. And make sure you're subscribed. We've got 24 more of these to go. You're not going to want to miss them. And we do have another wonderful interview with the Guilty as Charged podcast. Always a pleasure to have onto the channel. So make sure you don't go anywhere and don't miss that conversation towards the back end of the video. But without further ado, let's dive into the Los Angeles Chargers. As always, taking a look at this team's offseason, where they got better, where they got worse, going position group by position group. And that does start with the coaching staff which is obviously upgraded. Brandon Staley was a dumpster fire of a head coach, a dumpster fire of a defensive coordinator. His iteration of the Vic Fangio defense was a true disgrace. And with all due respect to Brandon Staley, I'm happy for the Chargers to be rid of that and to be able to look forward with Jim Harbaugh coming in as the head coach. We'll have plenty of time to talk about in the staff section what this new look staff is going to look like. But um, really from the head coach down to the coordinators on both sides of the ball, complete overhaul there and presumed upgrades. Though maybe some pause on swapping Kellen Moore for Greg Roman. We'll talk about that. Um, but still upgraded for the coaching staff overall. Quarterback, no change at all. Staying neutral, obviously. Then at running back, Look, I'm going to leave this as upgraded based on what Austin Eckler was for this team last year. It was, again, hard to watch. I mean, he lost the juice, especially as a rushing threat, just nothing really there. And even if you liked what you saw from Austin Eckler, to not have to give a third of your snaps to Josh Kelly anymore is going to be huge for this team. He was so bad. Some of the worst vision I've seen on tape over the last couple of years, so... Going with Gus Edwards, a six-round pick, and Kamani Vidal, who I love, and J.K. Dobbins. I do see that group as an upgrade, especially in terms of the actual run game. They might not quite get what they got from Eckler in terms of the receiving game. Um, and then with the tight end room, I'm going to leave this as neutral. Gerald Everett was very solid for this team, but only played half of this team's snaps. They bring in Will Disley. Not quite the receiving threat, but a substantial upgrade in the blocking game. And then Hayden Hurst, if he can stay healthy, could give you 80% of Gerald Everett in the receiving game. So going to keep it neutral at tight end. Nothing too exciting there, but I get the direction they're going there, going with more of a blocking focus starter. But then the wide receiver room. This is obviously downgraded. It's one of the biggest downgraded rooms in the entire NFL. Keenan Allen traded to the Bears for a fourth round pick. He was still fantastic last season. So that's going to be a big loss. And then on paper, losing Mike Williams, even though he only got through uh, about two and a half games last year. And then I got to give a little nod to my guy, Alex Erickson, who played pretty well down the stretch with Easton Stick and company. Uh, but you are excited about bringing in Lad McConkey in the second round, but he is not Keenan Allen, at least not yet. Um, and then DJ Chark. Definitely had his issues for the Panthers last year. Um, and then Brandon Rice in the seventh round. So it's just, you know, trying to replace that true number one that you had in Keenan Allen. It's 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 tough. And something they're, they're going to have to kind of scheme around and work around this season. Certainly one of those holes where you're like, well, they weren't going to completely fix this room in one offseason. Um, but then on the offensive line, definitely upgraded. I mean, they draft Joe Alt in the top of the draft. You love that. They signed Bradley Bozeman, who this staff is familiar with, going back to the days in Baltimore. They do lose a pair of centers. Corey Lindsley, a big name, but had kind of 
fallen off for this team. Unfortunate uh, neck injury. Only played a couple games for them last year and then retired, basically, um, before he retired. Uh, and then Will Clapp stepped in, gave you a replacement-level guy, but you expect Bradley Bozeman to at least be a push there. And then you add Joe Alt to the mix. Obvious upgrades. Overall, definitely a shift, though, towards you know prioritizing the line of scrimmage, the run game, a blocking tight end, a tackle over a guy like Malik Neighbors in the draft. That's the focus of this team in year one, right? There's... They're not trying to hide that. Even down to the offensive coordinator going with a run-focused Greg Roman over a pass-focused Kellen Moore. But then you look at the defense, and it's it's quietly pretty much the same. Definitely some change on the interior of the defensive line, but that was already a pedestrian group. So you're just moving some names around. You, uh, Sebastian Joseph Day was cut at the end of last season. Austin Johnson, a veteran. Nick Williams, a veteran. They bring in Puna Ford, who's been quiet the last couple of years, but still you would think an adequate piece. And they draft Justin Aboigby in the fourth round. You know, as we'll see later, this is still very much a problem group for this Chargers team. But it's not like they had any had any good players to lose anyway. So I'm just going to leave that as neutral. Edge group, leaving that as neutral. They brought back their key pieces there in Mac and Bosa. They added a fourth guy in Bud Dupree. Not enough for me to note that as any sort of upgrade. Um, at linebacker, they definitely are shifting this room around. I think this is to be determined. You know, Eric Kendricks and Kenneth Murray as a combo platter was an adequate group last year and this year they're going with you know a rookie junior colson and an injury prone denzel perriman who i like but how many games are you going to get out of them so to be determined there i see the direction they're going again more of that priority towards the physical smart run defenders as opposed to more of the athlete types there so staying consistent with that theme for the team Um, and then at cornerback Going to have this as slightly upgraded strictly off the fact that Michael Davis was truly horrible last season. It's going to be difficult for Christian Fulton to be worse than that. And then they also draft Cam Hart in the fifth round. Tarheeb still in the fifth round. No major upgrades, but hoping to be a little bit better there at least. Safety room is mostly the same. They bring back Aloe Gilman, and then they, you know have already crossed the line of all of these nepotism Ravens hires. Why not bring back Tony Jefferson two years removed from retirement and bad football? We'll see if he makes the team. Um, And then special teams, they had an outstanding special teams last year. No reason to change anything. They actually even kept the special teams coordinator, despite Harbaugh flipping the staff inside out. Shout out Ryan Ficken, who seems to have ended years and years of horrific special teams play for the Chargers. But I think it was a good offseason, as we'll see later in the video as we really go through position by position, breaking down these rosters, you'll see that there are still some major holes on this team, holes that were going to be impossible for this team to fill in one offseason especially coming off the heels of spending a lot of money, being a little more aggressive to make that push with guys like J.C. Jackson and Khalil Mack. They didn't have a bunch of free agent money to move around here. So I do think for what they had to work with, kind of implementing this new regime, they did a good job. But we'll put the roster conversation on the back burner for a second as next I want to focus on this coaching staff, break down how Jim Harbaugh and company kind of rank and stack up against the rest of the league and what this team is going to look like schematically on both sides of the ball here. And with Harbaugh coming in, the theory here is that the Chargers finally, after a run of just abysmal head coaches, finally will have an adult running the room, right? Jim Harbaugh is the guy that has won everywhere he's went, right? From San Diego State to Stanford to the 49ers to Michigan. He has met or exceeded expectations every single step of the way, leading the charge with his kind of rah-rah CEO mentality where he has really proven that he can come in and establish toughness, culture and physicality within an organization. And I'm not going to lie, it's going to be weird to think of the 
Chargers like that, the team that honestly has been beat into my brain at this point, that this is year in, year out, typically one of the softest teams in the NFL. And the Brandon Staley defense was maybe the pinnacle of that playing 10 yards off the line of scrimmage, afraid to get into base defense and stop the run. Harbaugh's goal here is to have a complete role reversal in terms of the type of football team that the Chargers are. And in this series, we rank teams overall coach and culture being obviously the culture of the team, but kind of that benefit of the doubt slider and all of the new incoming head coaches that we've revealed in this series so far have ranked very low in that category. Not so much with the Chargers. I give them a B grade ranking 12th to 18th in the league in terms of just coach and culture. In fact, Jim Harbaugh, I expect to kind of pick up somewhere around where he left off when he was with the 49ers years ago. I rank him as the 16th best head coach in the league before ever coaching a game for this Chargers team. So I do buy into that aspect of things. I do think this was a good hire. And he's given us, like I said, no reason to believe that this isn't going to work here. Now, if there are criticisms or at least like areas of pause on this hire, number one, it's that Harbaugh isn't like the vast majority of head coaches in the league in being a true kind of X's and O's schematic elevator of his football team. There's only two or three CEO type head coaches in the league, one of which being his brother, John in Baltimore. And as his brother has shown that can work, but it does mean you better be a damn good leader, which we do think Jim Harbaugh is, Um, but you got to really stay on top of your staff. Make sure you're hiring the right guys. Make sure that message is consistent throughout the entire team. And you're going to run the risk of potentially losing the good guys that you do hire. And you got to be good at replenishing those guys. So it it is a tall task. It can be done. But there is a reason that the majority of coaches in the league stem from either being a great defensive coordinator or an offensive coordinator. That's not really Jim Harbaugh. And then maybe just the other area of, again, slight pause, not criticism or even that I don't think this is going to work out, but just like a, a little bit of a... Hmm. Was this idea of hiring Greg Roman, the kind of in general overemphasis on this basically Ravens, Michigan nepotism going with a guy like Greg Roman that a he's comfortable with, has worked with, has had success in the past, but B is kind of a little over the top in terms of we're going to run the ball. We're going to be old school. That's all great. And they've done a lot of stuff to get in that direction. But is there is there a line? Is there a point in time where you need to accept, okay, but we do have Justin Herbert. We can sling the rock. There are, uh, you know, assets to having that player that hiring a Greg Roman, and this is a good transition into who Greg Roman is as the offensive coordinator here. You know, Greg Roman for years and years and years has been known for his teams can run the ball, but when it's third and eight, can he scheme up a passing game and for the most part the answer to that question has been no and that's what kind of ran him out of baltimore we saw lamar jackson the first year after greg roman um won an mvp throwing the ball a lot more granted he also won an mvp under greg roman in that run heavy play action heavy offense too so there are assets to greg roman but this hire and this overall decision by jim harbaugh is interesting to say the least And when you look at the rankings for the offensive coordinator here, I have them ranked with a B-plus grade, 5th to 7th in run game coaching. There is an obvious tip of the cap to give to Greg Roman for being one of the run game gurus around the NFL. He's proven that. But pass game coaching tied for worst in the league, 28th to 32nd. And I think that has also been warranted as you reflect back on what Greg Roman has done in the NFL. And I think you do have to beg the question of, is this the right coordinator for Justin Herbert? Greg Roman has had all these great run games, but with Lamar Jackson, Colin Kaepernick, elite rushing threats at the quarterback position. And it's not that they can't or won't run with Justin Herbert, 
but he's not those guys in terms of speed, agility, running creativity, vision, all of that stuff. Yeah, you can run a read option and he can get the edge and pick up a first down, but is he someone you're going to do all of the various different run game stuff that Greg Roman has been able to tap into with some of these other quarterbacks in years past? I I think that's very much to be determined. But also, going with a guy that wants to live in 12, 13 personnel with multiple tight ends and fullbacks on the field, a guy that is really shown to have struggles in terms of scheming up the drop back passing game, and you look at Justin Herbert being one of the premium pocket passers in the NFL, there's questions to be had about how this is all going to work. And I think every Chargers fan, for the most part, is willing to accept that this is interesting and might not work. And I am just so curious to see what this iteration of Greg Roman's offense is going to look like. Is this going to be... The Ravens offense, where, like I said, it's it's heavy packages, all play action, a QB-oriented run game with read options, and even getting into things like QB power and all that stuff. Or has he taken some time to reflect and learn, and is he going to bring more of a modern approach to designing this offense and tapping into Justin Herbert's arm and the passing game a little bit better? Time would tell you it's going to be the former, But needless to say, one of the bigger kind of wild card X factors for this team is what is the, you know, coordination of this offense going to look like? But then as you look at the defensive side of things, not so much to question here, a very sound hire in Jesse Minter, who's going to get a B minus grade for me for run defense coaching and a C plus grade for me for pass defense coaching. Obviously can't rank him too high as an unproven new mind in the NFL, but those grades are all just unprovenness and not anything negative to say about Jesse Minter. Essentially, long story short, they're looking to recreate Mike McDonald, who has obviously emerged as perhaps the premium defensive mind in the NFL, not just getting the head coach with the Seattle Seahawks after being with the Ravens, and coaching this Michigan defense for a little bit. But you also look around the league, and there's a handful of other teams that have poached the Ravens staff trying to recreate the scheme that has been built really between Michigan and Baltimore. And who better than Jesse Minter to be that guy who was with Mike McDonald really side-by-side as an assistant coach for about four years in Baltimore, and then went to, I want to say Vanderbilt for a year. And then once Mike McDonald left Michigan, Jesse Minner stepped in there and did a phenomenal job orchestrating a championship defense in Michigan. So plenty of good things to say about Jesse Minner and plenty of reason to believe that this is going to work out. Um, In terms of what this scheme is going to look like, we have covered this already when we talked about the Titans And we will continue to talk about this team with this Mike McDonald scheme that is permeating throughout the league. It is, at its core, an attacking 3-4 defense. But it is so far removed from the Dean Pease, Wink Martindale style 3-4 blitz-happy team uh, that we got so used to in Baltimore for years. It has taken a lot of these same principles using stand-up edge rushers, dropping them into coverage, varying your looks, disguising blitzes, and running a lot of, you know, cover three fire zones. It's taken a lot of those principles, but modernized them in a very creative way that really works for these young players. And I've talked about this, but, you know, with Mike McDonald and Jesse Minner here, they had to design this defense to be a pro style defense at the college level, but in a way that the players could understand. Cause at the college level, you have 19 year old kids. You've got the transfer portal. You have only, you know, three or four years of experience opposed to, as opposed to like true veterans in the NFL. And what they did was completely modernize the terminology in a way that is very easy to understand. But 
can also be extremely multiple. And I'm still very much learning how this works, and I obviously can't break down all of the lingo in depth. If I could, maybe I'd be the next guy getting hired to run this defense in the NFL. But um, one of the big kind of emphasis is on what they do that helps them achieve all of this is they teach their guys every single gap up front. They'll rotate these guys around in practice, and then based on the call, their lingo, wherever you're lined up, you can know every single different blitz, and they can stay incredibly adaptable throughout a drive, throughout a game from week to week, and essentially have the same calls that can look entirely different to the offense. And needless to say, that's a handful to deal with. So their fronts are very creative, but I also think that what we've seen from these Michigan and Mike McDonald defenses is that not only are they innovative and creative up front, but because they've had to coach college kids, I think they've really found a way to implement these pattern matching zones that we're seeing all around the NFL, you know, the the influx of cover six and cover four in college football, you know, Saban inspired Saban, his defense has infected all of college football. But again, having to coach college kids to run this stuff is different. And they are just really good communicators of these zone responsibilities on the back end. And in Baltimore, you just, you straight up didn't see the coverage busts. You saw guys playing confident, knowing when to jump routes, when to pass things off, but also when you do need to stay more conservative. They're just very good at teaching every individual player their role, whether that is up front on the back or on the back end, but also making sure they understand how their role impacts the rest of the defense. And it just has all come together into this beautiful scheme. And when you can have creative blitz looks up front that create free rushers and keep the offense thinking, speed up the processor of the quarterback, while also disguising pattern matching zones on the back end, it is incredibly difficult to deal with, just as we saw in Baltimore last year. So they are looking to replicate that system here for the Chargers. And while all these other guys are getting hired to replicate that system around the league, technically speaking, Jesse Minter is the only guy that has shown that he can do that. So it's exciting, um, but he does have to prove that he can do that at the NFL level. But a good hire makes total sense why Harbaugh brought him over from Michigan. So there's your coach and scheme breakdown. Chargers fans have every reason to be excited about this staff with perhaps some um, cause for pause with Greg Roman here. But let's shift to the roster breakdown here. We're going to go position by position, ranking each position group, how they stack up against the rest of the league. And that's going to start with the quarterback and Justin Herbert. And I, I feel like I have been dubbed this Justin Herbert hater, especially by you Chargers fans watching this because I was obscenely low on him coming out. I was dead ass wrong about the type of player he was going to be at the NFL level, obviously. And when it comes to a lot of those Twitter debates, I do tend to put a name or two higher than Justin Herbert than a lot of Chargers fans would like to see. And there are some things with him that I do think hold him back from being an elite quarterback. I will talk about those later. But look, Justin Herbert is phenomenal. He is fantastic. He's still, frankly, the reason that the Chargers are 15th in Super Bowl odds because you know... If things do go right with the team around him, you have a quarterback that, yeah, he's never won a playoff game, but you think with a much better team, he is a Super Bowl caliber quarterback, the type of quarterback that you win with, right? So many things to like about him as a quarterback. I have him ranked as the fifth best passing quarterback, the sixth best overall quarterback in the NFL. Genuinely one of the elite arms in the NFL. And he weaponizes it uh, as, as good as anybody. I mean, the way he throws those deep outs, especially, it's just 
gorgeous, man. You, you can go opposite hash, a 20-yard out. Teams get used to not having to defend that throw because you're not supposed to, you know, put the ball on the sideline from the opposite hash 20 yards away with the precision that he's able to throw or on like a back shoulder as well. His command of the football in that like 20 to 25 yard range is impeccable. And it shows up in the middle of the field too. He can needle the middle of it, of the defense. Some of these digs and posts that he throws are unbelievable. Uh, the velocity in which he can get the ball in there and the nice thing, too, is he can do it from the pocket and does do it from the pocket consistently. Um, but when he does get outside the pocket, which I wish was more often, but when he does it, he makes some of the most sensational throws that you'll see in the NFL throughout the course of the season. He can do it running left, running right, off his back foot. doesn't matter. So he has one of the best arms in the NFL, and he knows it. And then you get into the processing and decision-making aspect of things. Um, you know, it's it's certainly good enough that when paired with his level of arm talent, that's how you get a, you know, superstar quarterback. I, I think it's not perfect. There's still room to grow there. For the most part, he makes the right reads. He plays on time. He will still miss reads. He's not quite on the level of the, the game's best players at that position. Guys like maybe Dak Prescott, Kirk Cousins, Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow. He's not quite up into the top, maybe five to seven in that category, but I would say top 10-ish in terms of processing and decision-making. I think what he lacks in that department is something you hear people talk about with him is you want to see just a little bit more aggressiveness from him especially when you're talking about a guy with this arm talent, take a few more risks within the structure of the offense. You know, there's a play against Minnesota that I'll highlight here where they're running a double move. He gets single high coverage and he just checks off the double move before he even sees if the wide receiver wins, he would have had a touchdown. He ends up coming to the backside and um, overthrowing a pass. It's obviously just one play, but throughout the course of a game, you'll see maybe once or twice a week situations like this where you wish he pushed the ball a little bit more instead of, you know, trying to, you know, needle in, you know, the short to intermediate zones where he loves to target. He just does. He loves to throw short. But again, very good in the processing and decision making department for the most part, just does not put the ball in harm's way, especially as one of the um, least interception prone quarterbacks in the league for good reason. But does that come at the cost of some added aggressiveness? Would you rather him throw five more picks, but his average depth of target goes up one and a half throughout the course of a season? You could argue, yeah. But that's very nitpicky. Um, and, and frankly, not what keeps him out of the elite quarterback conversation for me. Um, honestly, what straight up bothers me about Justin Herbert and what does, quote unquote, hold him back just a little bit in my mind is the pocket feel. And this is where I have to differentiate between what in my mind is pocket presence and pocket feel, because I have said a lot of times I don't like Justin Herbert's pocket presence and Chargers fans will throw sack rate at me and all this stuff. And it's true. There are parts of Justin Herbert's pocket presence that are very good um, in this, in the fact that if pressure gets in quickly, Justin Herbert can see that and do something about it, right? If his guard loses or the blitz gets in or a tackle loses the edge, that is when you do see Justin Herbert use his feet make something happen or get rid of the ball, avoid sacks. There are aspects of him within the pocket that are very good. But for me, his pocket feel to naturally feel the rush to know when and how to use his feet to buy time and extend plays is below average. Way too often with Justin Herbert, you'll see him throw the ball short of the sticks on third down. You'll see him bail out of a clean pocket. You'll see him step into pressure. You'll see him not use his feet to manage that space within the pocket to buy time, whether that is inside the pocket or outside of the pocket. 
to me, that supernatural feel that all of these elite quarterbacks have for that space within the pocket, it's an intangible thing that something like sack rate is not going to tell you if a guy has it or not. You have to watch the film and, yes, come to a subjective opinion on if the guy has it or not. But to me, Justin Herbert is missing that trait that, in my opinion, Mahomes has, Burrow has, Josh Allen has, Lamar Jackson has, Aaron Rodgers has, Drew Brees had it, Tom Brady had it. Call it poise, call it pocket presence, call it pocket feel, call it it factor. Whatever that needs to be, that is what I see missing a little bit with Justin Herbert. And it's not to say there aren't individual plays where it's there and he does feel the rush and gets out of the pocket at the right time and does incredible things on the move. It's just, I find myself, when he does do those things, it goes away for two quarters, two weeks, and you just find yourself saying, Herbert, use your feet more, whether that's moving inside the pocket or breaking outside of the pocket and doing all these incredible things you can do. Um, so I don't need to belabor the point. I think I used film evidence as well to show you what I'm seeing and why I have that opinion. So Chargers fans, the next time we get into it on Twitter, it's all there. That's where I'm at on Justin Herbert. The dude's fantastic. And even if this is who he is as the sixth best quarterback in the NFL, that is a guy worth every single penny that they paid him and a guy that this team should be able to win a Super Bowl with someday if they do things the right way. And then there is the rushing aspect of this that with a Greg Roman offense, we're going to need to talk about. We'll save that for the uh, backfield breakdown that we'll get to in a little bit. But in terms of the um, backup room, Easton Stick did step in and ran the show last year. I actually especially think his mobility inside a Greg Roman offense in like a, you know, Herbert hurt his wrist and needs to sit a week. I would actually be very curious to see him basically do the Greg Roman read option stuff. He's very athletic and, and can definitely be a weapon in that way. So I think he's a good backup to have here, frankly, especially now with the new coordinator. Um, and you can honestly say the same thing about Max Dugan, who the only good thing he did at TCU was run the ball, in my opinion. So they've got a they've got a type with their backup room that is is workable, especially now. But let's transition to the weaponry for this team. And unfortunately for the Chargers, I do rank them dead last in the NFL with a D plus grade. It's it's honestly kind of hard to argue against that as well. They lost some premium weapons, and um, as much as I love the Lad McConkey pick. And I'm going to hype that up in a minute. There's just, there's not a lot here. Heading into the year, their number one wide receiver is Joshua Palmer, who was very serviceable as a number three wide receiver, right? But I think we have seen in those weeks where Mike Williams is out, Keenan, Keenan Allen is out. It's not like he's blown up in those situations and has never really taken the mantle and been like, oh my God, you've got some great starter here. You know, it's... It's not a huge surprise either when you look at his college profile. He's he's tough. He's got good feet. He runs good routes, good hands, um, but just a limited athlete and a non-sensational player. And for that to be quite clearly your best wide receiver heading into the year, it lays the groundwork for you being the worst group of weapons in the league. Now, that's not to say I don't love Lad McConkey, right? Um, but he is an unproven second-round pick. I can't come out and great him out as this great wide receiver but I, i've i've said it before i'll say it again he is up there with the best route running prospects i've ever watched um, in the mix with guys like jerry judy and chris olave in fact i think his potential is somewhere in that range and while i think he can thrive in the slot with his dare i say elite foot speed technique within his short routes the nuance to set guys up with shoulder fakes and the way he can run a two-way go from the slot is is indefensible certainly was in the sec and i i don't see a lot of nfl corners being able to keep with them uh, keep up with them in a lot of these routes too and i think a lot of people just slide him into the slot I don't see Lad McConkey that way. I think he can thrive in the slot, but can also be a weapon outside. 
And part of that makes him the ideal Keenan Allen replacement because they loved to do that with Keenan Allen, move them all over the place. And while this is a different staff, I am very excited to see if they do that with Ladd because I think when you put him outside, he flashed the ability to get off of press coverage. He didn't see a lot of press in college, but he does have a good release package. And he's not tiny. He's not the biggest wide receiver, but we compared him to guys like Chris Olave and Jerry Judy. He's actually very similar in size to those guys, and I would say he's very similar in terms of top speed to those guys. He actually pulls away from guys and is more of a deep threat than he gets credit for. He wasn't used that way in George's offense, but I do think when teams are going to be so worried about him running speed outs and slants and two-way goes from the slot, all of these different things that Herbert and Keenan Allen were so good at together, I think you can destroy guys on double moves or just run a go and catch a guy flat-footed and create some deep separation and become a bit of a super weapon for the Chargers. I loved this pick from a fantasy football angle. I have been targeting Ladd as hot and heavy as I can I maybe I'm crazy, but I had the fifth pick in a dynasty draft. I genuinely considered him over Malik neighbors because of the fit and the quarterback that he gets to play with. And I think year one has a chance of being special for lad McConkey. So I don't know really what else I can say there. I, I don't remember a second round wide receiver that I had such high expectations for, but he does have to prove he can be that guy. He's got to prove he can stay healthy. He was always getting banged up at Georgia and has to prove that he can produce like that because the film was incredible, but the stats were never quite there with Georgia. So there's been a little bit missing in that department. He's got to prove that his best football is ahead of him here, right? But then you get to Quentin Johnston, and he was my wide receiver one last year. I'm obviously pulling for him for that reason. Um, and and to be fair, when the Chargers drafted him, I said, give him a year. He's got a lot to learn. He's got to diversify his route tree. He's got to learn how to attack the football better. And he was forced into a larger role in year one. And frankly, the team last year didn't do a good enough job using him in the ways that I thought they should have used him in terms of just get him the, get the ball in his hands. He's this elite run after catch threat. I didn't think they did a good enough job running crossing routes, just bubble screens, and other creative ways to get the ball in his hands. And with all that, year one was ugly. Now, I'm not trying to just attach to my draft take on the guy, but I think the fact that we knew he was a little bit more raw than some of these other rookies does matter to bring that up. And not every great wide receiver is great right away, though most are. Hell, you don't even have to look any further on this depth chart to find another guy in DJ Chark who was horrible his rookie season and then looked like a star in year two. Now, I can't explain what happened after that, but you do at least have one voice in the building to tell Quentin Johnston, hey, year one doesn't define your career. Now, that goes without saying his tape was really poor as a rookie, as a first-round rookie. And the biggest thing I think with, with Quentin was the, the lack of ball skills. This was an issue for him at TCU and continued to be a problem in his rookie year where he just, he fights the ball. He doesn't have the, I guess, poise, confidence, awareness, whatever it is to do his job and bring the ball down. You know, honestly, the raw drops where he was open and got an accurate pass, those actually weren't that bad. He only had two drops on 65 targets. But what was really what what really showed up and where the, the frustration came from watching him was in the contested catches. Just seven of twenty-two on contested catch looks for a bigger wide receiver, right? And a lot of these were, they weren't like, oh, you've got to go elevate over a D-back. It's just like, yeah, you've got a corner on your hip pocket and you've got to play through contact. You've got to show some of that toughness, some of that my ball bitch mentality. It's not there with him. And that to me is going to be the defining thing in whether or not Quentin Johnston can work out. Because if you can't trust him down the field, he is just... 
LaVisca Chenault, someone that you can only throw, you know, crossing routes and bubble screens to. And there have to be legitimate concerns on if that can come from him based on now multiple years of tape because that was an issue at TCU. Now, the other issue with him in his rookie year was separation. He had all those contested catch targets because he couldn't get open. And I'm less worried about that, to be honest. I think his athletic tools are phenomenal. And I think on certain routes, he still shows the foot speed and the technique within those routes to get open. And it's not like he was never open. He did um, have some flashes of getting open down the field. And then whether or not he was going to catch the ball was spotty. But with Quentin, it it comes back to playing through contact. Um, He did struggle with press coverage at the uh, NFL level much more than I thought he would. Better corners with better technique that could stick their hands on his chest. He struggled to get off of that. And then having to deal with more physical contact down the field, he didn't show an ability to accelerate through that uh, as you need to have at the NFL level. And I just, it's to me, that's it's a coaching thing. It's a technique thing. And it's going to come down to being an effort thing from him. But the opportunity is still going to be here for Quentin Johnston, just as it was last year. I mean, from the opportunity alone, believe it or not, he did still have 38 catches for 430 yards last year and a pair of touchdowns. So I'm going to choose to believe in Quentin Johnston. It is an overwhelming tidal wave of negativity surrounding him. But hey, it's also not like draft Twitter's love child of Jackson Smith and Jigbo is that much better as a rookie. So he's a polarizing player. Um, There's clearly a world where he's just a bust. But I also think that um, if if any receiver here is going to benefit from Greg Roman being the offensive coordinator, I think it's Quentin Johnston because um, for all of Greg Roman's problems in the drop back passing game, he is very good at manufacturing touches four players like Quentin Johnston who are very good with the ball in his hands. So I'm going to maintain a one foot in one foot out approach with him. And I am going to put the arrow up on him because I just, I do think it's even if he's a, he's a little bit better than he was last year and a little bit more useful within this offense, it's going to be better than he was last year. Now he's going to rotate, I think with DJ Chark who until lad McConkey shows that he's some great deep deep threat on the outside, and even then they're going to want to use him in the slot, right? Um, DJ Chark is going to be the guy that this team can trust to just run a deep post off of play action, get those manufactured deep shots once or twice a game. That's kind of the role he had in Detroit the year before where he was much more efficient, obviously, than having to be that guy in Bryce Young's Panthers offense last year. Um, I think he's a useful player to have here. He's going to play that role, give you nothing more, give you nothing less. A fine enough signing and maybe somebody I'd want as like a last round draft pick in best ball because he might have, um, you know, when he catches the ball, it could be 55 yards and a touchdown. But someone in your normal fantasy leagues, you're not going to want to touch because you don't know what week that's going to happen. After that, I don't really believe in any of these guys, to be honest. Um, I was not a Brendan Rice guy. To me, he was just missing a gear, considering he was Jerry Rice's son. Um, His acceleration is some of the worst I've seen for a wide receiver. And, And we talked about Quentin Johnston not being able to accelerate through contact in his routes. I mean, that happened to Brendan Rice at the college level. The second a D back gets his hands on him, it's like he's been lassoed into tight coverage. He just he can't pull away. He can win some contested catches. If if he goes completely untouched and he's running a go against off coverage, he has okay speed, like long speed. But um, to me, I just I didn't see the twitch of an NFL wide receiver. So he's getting some hype. I'll believe it when I see it. You've got Darius Davis who is a phenomenal kick returner. He played into this team's um, special teams being as good as they were last year. Entirely limited to a gadget role within the offense, though. You've got Cornelius Johnson, who might make this team for a kind of gunner and special teams role. Clearly, that's a locker room guy that Harbaugh wanted to bring in here from Michigan. He was a role player uh, within that offense, made tough catches in the clutch 
but not much of a separator. Um, also a very good run blocker, something that they might want to, you know, put him in in certain packages. Uh, you got Simi Fajoko, another big-bodied guy. Was a fourth-round pick for the Dallas Cowboys, who I kind of liked. Hasn't really gotten that opportunity, but I don't think he's also shown that he sucks either. So if there's anybody after DJ Chark that I'm fascinated in, it would be Fajoko as maybe like a big slot within this offense. But obviously not something you're counting on there. And then you have four other undrafted free agents that I didn't get to. Um, but there are opportunities for one of these guys to win a roster spot. You know, I think wide receiver five and six are, are wide open. So if any of these guys makes the team, it's it's someone to at least keep an eye on because there are opportunities to go around with with a great quarterback here in Justin Herbert. And then you get to the tight end room. And Will Disley will be the primary tight end here because he is, frankly, one of the better blocking tight ends in the game. They signed him for that reason. He does stuff as a receiving tight end. He has very strong hands, wins contested catches, but not a separator at all. So he is exactly as advertised in that department. And then when they have to get into third and nine, 11 personnel, that's where I expect to see this combination of Hayden Hurst, Donald Parham, whoever is healthy that week, maybe. <laughs> um, both these guys have had a really hard time staying on the field. Um, but Hurst, obviously a former first-round pick, for what it's worth, did have a good final season with the Ravens before he signed with the Panthers and then couldn't stay healthy. So if they can luck into a healthy season from him, theoretically he could have a nice season. But counting on that is very, very hard to rely on, obviously. And then Donald Parham, kind of the same deal. I can't quit Donald Parham because he's such a freak. He's 6'8", can run, makes really tough catches, uh, made it to the NFL after breaking out in the XFL. And he, again, just has not been able to stay on the football field. I really wish I could sit here and predict a Donald Parham breakout season in the Mark Andrews role within this offense. Um, but from a durability standpoint, I just can't go there. But he is my favorite player in this tight end room for whatever that's worth. And then you have another um, receiving specialist in Stone Smart. I don't even know if he'll make the team over guys like Zach Haynes and Luke Benson. They might want another blocking guy in the room, which really isn't Stone Smart. And then you have the receiving backs, and it's it's one of the more lowly groups in terms of receiving threats from the running back room. You know, J.K. Dobbins is good at it, but again, how many games are you getting from J.K. Dobbins at this point? He has not been able to stay healthy. If he is, though, he's a guy that can catch dump-offs, be a really good threat on screens, that type of receiving threat. Hasn't really shown to be a guy that you'll flex out wide and do all these crazy routes with or anything like that. Um, Gus Edwards is is a non-factor beyond screens. Big straight line back. But then Kamani Vidal, we're about to hype him up in a big, big way when we get to the backfield section here. But uh, he has great contact balance, was a relatively productive back um, that didn't have drop issues or anything like that at Troy. So again, we'll, we'll hype him up in a big, big way in a minute here. But I... I am a huge fan of him if that opportunity comes. You got Isaiah Spiller, likewise, can catch the ball. Pretty smooth hands, but um, just a limited athlete. I think his athleticism was always overrated coming out of Texas A&M. Um, and then Jared Patterson, another guy to keep an eye on, kind of that short, stocky, contact, balance style guy. But needless to say, we don't have anybody in this room that is anything close to what Austin Eckler's been over the years or any sort of dynamic threat out of the backfield. So that's how you get your D plus group of weapons. You are entirely counting on the upside of two young players, Lad McConkey and Quentin Johnston. And then beyond that, it's, you know, health, health questions galore with all the ancillary weapons. And even Josh Palmer is coming off an injury as well. So certainly the first room that we're looking at here that you can see, yeah, they, uh, we got work to do, and we're going to fix everything here this offseason alone, even if there is some developmental upside with some of these guys. 
But next up, let's talk about the backfield. And frankly, having to talk about Gus Edwards and J.K. Dobbins are just a roadblock to get to Kamani Vidal, who I am so excited for here for the Chargers. But I do think it's going to be a little bit because Gus especially and a little bit of J.K. Dobbins are capable running backs. You know, I'm just, I'll get it out of the way. I just really am not a J.K. Dobbins believer. I I already wasn't the biggest J.K. Dobbins guy in Baltimore. And now you stack on top of that severe injury questions. Not only do I wonder if he can stay available, but... I just wonder how good he really is when healthy at this point. I do think we've seen a drop off in his athletic juice due to the really serious lower body injuries that have stacked up for him. And it's not like they gave him a lot of guaranteed money either. Them them signing him was entirely like, look, we believe in the football character. We believe in the film when you are a healthy player. But anything you get from him is house money. When healthy, though... You know, he has great vision, good contact balance, good patience, a nice back, but you get the point there. But when it comes to Gus Edwards, you know, I do think there's still juice there. It's just more of a durability question for him. But when he's played, at least recently, he's looked every bit as good as Gus Edwards has been. He is a massive speed train runner. He's a one-trick pony. You kind of know what he is, but he's very effective at being that straight-line power back. And one thing that does set Gus Edwards apart from the typical 230-plus pound running back is he does have a really explosive first step. It allows him to slip into smaller holes get into that second level quickly, and then also generate that momentum more quickly that allows him to run with a lot of power. And that does set him apart from maybe someone like an A.J. Dillon or a variety of other really big backs that haven't even gotten to the point that A.J. Dillon did for Green Bay. So he's a useful player, but again, someone that has had durability concerns over the last, I mean, really throughout his career. Physical runner takes a lot of big hits and tends to wear down. And those durability concerns on both of these two players play into a massive amount of excitement from me for the rookie Kamani Vidal. Look, I already liked Kamani Vidal. He was my fifth ranked running back in this draft class. Definitely thought he should have been drafted around the top 100 picks in the draft. And he ends up falling to the sixth round. But it's not like this is a position group where... We never see guys fall later in the draft and then end up proving you right, right? Like running backs just fall in the draft because of the positional value, but I'm not so much worried about it as I would be with other positions. And this dude, to me, even though he played at Troy, just has the traits and the tape that I so confidently believe will translate to the next level. I love these shorter, stocky running backs Kamani Vidal comes in at 5'8", 215 pounds. And when you're built that low to the earth and you're that big and strong, you're just a bowling ball of needles to try and get down. His contact balance is exceptional. He was second in all of college football in missed tackles forced for a reason. And even though that was at Troy, he looked good at the Senior Bowl, and it's a skill set that I firmly believe will translate. It's like trying to wrestle a boulder and get it to the ground. It's just extremely difficult to do. Very much shades of someone like a Kareem Hunt coming out of Toledo who had a very similar trait. But Kamani Vidal is actually faster. He ran a 4-4-5. He did catch balls out of the backfield. So he's not just a plotter. He's got juice and big playability too. I, I wish I had the words to truly capture what I mean by this, because I talk positively about players throughout this series, but this might be the player in this entire 32 team series in over 60 hours of content that I am planning my flag and saying, you have to draft this guy in whatever fantasy league format you're in. Look out for this six year player to break out as a rookie because granted I can't, give him a rating that is higher than Gus Edwards and J.K. Dobbins that have shown stuff in the NFL, whereas whereas Vidal is just coming into the league as a six-round player. But 
Forget the health stuff for a second. I actually kind of believe Kamani Vidal is just a better running back than the other two guys right now. So even if Gus Edwards and J.K. Dobbins don't get hurt on a team that clearly wants to run the piss out of the football, even if they don't get hurt, I think Vidal might take this job. I think Harbaugh might see what he sees in Kamani Vidal and be like, oh my God, that's what we had in Blake Corum at Michigan, but he's faster. But then you sprinkle in the very likely possibility that one of or both of these players get hurt. I think all it's going to take is Vidal to just get on the field and show how good he is. And he's not going to look back. And after Trey Benson and Jonathan Brooks, I think the opportunity for Kamani Vidal is is better than any other rookie running back in this entire draft. I called my shot a few years back with James Robinson. I feel even stronger with Kamani Vidal when I say he he could be your league winner in fantasy football this year. So if you are playing on underdog fantasy or your home leagues or whatever it might be, get yourself Kamani Vidal, and I really hope I'm right. But it's not like it costs you much either because, again, sixth-round rookie, he's not going all that high. I could very easily seeing, if you're talking fantasy football, him being a top 16 running back this season, at least in the second half of the year once those opportunities come. And for real football, I actually think he can be a star running back in the league. Reminds me a little bit of like a Doug Martin coming out of Boise State, another contact balance oriented small school running back. And I wish I could show you the highlights, but they uh, they did get copyrighted because they were from a broadcast. But go watch some Kamani Vidal highlights if you don't believe me. The dude can ball out. Um, you do have some interesting backups behind him, though. Isaiah Spiller was kind of the reverse in terms of what I thought about a guy in the draft. Uh, someone that a lot of people liked. I didn't ever really see it. Don't like his vision or his first step juice. His opportunities haven't come here for the Chargers despite their backup running back room being horrific so not really any reason to believe in Isaiah Spiller at this point um, but Jarrett Patterson another kind of stocky compact undersized contact balance style back did actually get some reps as a rookie for Washington a couple years ago and was okay shades of like Devin Singletary there with with Jarrett Patterson so they clearly like that style they had that or at least Harbaugh had that in Blake Corum so someone again if if I'm wrong about Kamani Vidal you could maybe hedge that with a Jarrett Patterson if those injuries started to stack up on guys like Edwards and Dobbins ultimately obviously I can't rank this room too high you have two adequate starters that are extremely injury prone and a sixth round rookie running back that I'm fired up about but is a sixth round rookie running back so they do rank towards the bottom of the league with a C grade at running back ranking 28th to 30th that's not unfamiliar territory for the Chargers in terms of the run game they have not ranked all that high but Obviously, if Kamani Vidal hits, this could look a lot better at the end of the year. And in turn, this run game will project much better. And then it is time to talk about the kind of Greg Roman factor with Justin Herbert and what the QB run game is going to do for this run game. I do think it's going to be obviously, I mean, I can't say obviously, but with almost certainty, uh, utilized here to a larger degree than they've ever done with Justin Herbert, who is not Lamar Jackson as a runner. Nobody really is. Is not even Colin Kaepernick as a runner. I think relative to his size, he is very fast, right? But he's stiff. He doesn't necessarily have quick twitch athleticism to change lanes as a runner. He doesn't have a lot of experience doing it. I don't think he has the sort of ball carrier vision to run a lot of the variety of stuff that Greg Roman can and has done with his quarterback clearly doesn't have the shiftiness and all around creativity of a true running quarterback. But like I said, they'll use it more here specifically just read options to keep that backside end honest. I think will certainly be a part of this. I think they can go with an inverted read option where Herbert is the inside run threat. If things open up, and you might even see the occasional QB power, QB sweep type of deal. Some of the stuff that Buffalo does with like Josh Allen. 
and I would imagine they will do all of these things maybe three, four times a game just to keep you honest, and I think Herbert will be relatively effective doing those things. Again, I don't think he's Lamar Jackson. I don't think he's Josh Allen, even, who has a little bit more of that it factor as a true runner. But this should be a weapon for this offense that is new in terms of how they tap into Justin Herbert's talents. Going to be one of the more fascinating things to monitor this season is, is how and how much do they lean into the QB run game and then, as mentioned earlier, if anything were to happen to Justin Herbert for a week or two, I would actually be very fascinated to, to just watch this offense with Easton Stick uh, or even Max Dugan. Both those guys were very good rushing threats in college and could, in theory, run a Greg, o, uh, Greg Roman offense fairly well. But obviously, before I tell you how the overall run game ranks, we have to talk about the offensive line. The hog molly's paving the way here. And this is clearly a group that the Chargers are hoping to be a strength of this team, hence the Joe Walt pick at the top of the draft. And there's very little reason to believe that this can't be a strength for this team. I rank them very kindly, um, tied for the 11th best overall offensive line with B-minus rankings across the board. It's not flooded with superstar talent, but there's really no true holes here, and there's upside for... Um, guys to continue getting better here now you do have a superstar left tackle in Rashawn Slater one of the most technically polished left tackles from a pass protection standpoint in the entire league I don't want to say he's had to lean on his technique because he is still a very good athlete but he does have shorter arms is, is a little bit quote-unquote undersized uh, which is why they were able to get him outside the top 10 of the draft but he's kind of grown up um, I, I will say, like, leaning on his technique to uh, help compensate for some of the lack of size and length that he does have, but it, it absolutely works for him. He gets on guys quickly. He protects the edge with good foot speed. He has great awareness to cut off inside moves. He's excellent with his hands. What's not to love about Rashawn Slater? And then you see some of that athleticism show up in the run game. For whatever reason, wasn't as much of a factor as a run blocker last year as he's been throughout his career, but... Uh, I definitely think he's the best run blocker on this offensive line for now with the potential to be passed up by Joe Alt. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't have a bad word to say about Rashawn Slater. He's been fantastic since the second he stepped on the football field. It was a steal for the Chargers when they drafted him, and he's still an absolute rock. But then you have Zion Johnson, their former first-round pick from a couple of years ago at left guard. He hasn't been the superstar that I thought he was going to be coming out. I was really high on Zion Johnson, loved this pick when they made it, and he's just been, frankly, very week-to-week -week for the Chargers. There's been tons of flashes. He's played both left and right side. He's had games where he like locks down Chris Jones and everything's coming together, and he looks like the polished you know, monster that he was at Boston College. And then there's weeks where his size seems to be a disadvantage for him. There's weeks where he stops his feet and lets guys get in front of him and has a bunch of pass rush losses. And then in the run game, he's been very week to week as well. There are moments of him clearing out linebackers and showing off his remarkable athleticism in the trenches. And then there's weeks where he's not able to create some of that leg drive and where he does miss assignments in the run game. So it's it sounds lazy anytime you say a player just needs to improve his consistency. But for me, that's the definition of what Zion Johnson's problems have been. It's one thing here, one thing there, and a lot of flashes. I do think this staff, this commitment to the run game, their ability to kind of weaponize him a lot more as a puller and in a larger variety of run schemes that they just didn't really use for the Chargers since Zion Johnson has gotten uh, has been here could be good for him and um, I'm still gonna say the arrow is pointing up on him it's not that he's been a bust it's just he hasn't really cemented himself as a quality starter he's just been okay and it's a big year for him you know year three to make that leap I think uh, if he doesn't do it this year this just might be what he is. Then they signed Bradley Bozeman at center. I'm totally fine with him as uh, kind of a weak link in pass protection. Your center 
can be very easily schemed around in terms of getting him to work on double teams as much as possible. And I think in Carolina, we saw the worst of Bradley Bozeman get brought out because they were getting blitzed constantly because they couldn't handle it. That meant Bradley Bozeman was getting left on one, uh, one one-on-one a lot more. And he showed one-on-one he's just not that great in pass protection. His hands and his feet just have a hard time staying in front of guys. But in terms of his anchor and the experience he has and blitz recognition, He's all right. Again, as a weak link, you'll live with it. And especially when he's a very good run blocker. And even in Carolina, he showed to be that. That was something he thrived at in Baltimore before they brought in Tyler Linderbaum. No longer needed him. But he's got that play strength and that dickhead mentality you look for. And he's going to be an asset for them. And and better than what they had last year, at least as a run blocker, to move guys out of the middle of the, the defensive line. So I like the signing. Reminds me of the many various players that kind of, you know, go elsewhere, aren't as successful, and then return home. This, of course, being Baltimore Ravens West with Bradley Bozeman returning home in so many ways. And then Jamari Sawyer at right guard, an interesting player because he is 6'3", 330 pounds, very much built like someone you would expect to play guard. But in his rookie season, he actually played left tackle when Rashawn Slater got hurt and arguably showed better film out there. It's kind of weird to explain. Um, I don't have a great answer as to why, but that kind of held up in year two where he was an okay guard. He very clearly understands pass protection. He has accurate hands. Um, You know, his feet are technically sound, but are clunky because he's just not this overwhelming athlete and his foot speed can uh, leave him a little bit behind but I I thought he was an okay pass protecting guard Um, and the run blocking for him is just uh, again more underwhelming than you would expect for a guy his size he doesn't really fly off the ball doesn't create a lot of leg drive you know he plays more like a 6'3 300 pound offensive lineman and that he just isn't like his his Functional play strength isn't as good as you would think. His anchor's pretty good, but I I really wouldn't describe Jamari Sawyer as the mauler that I kind of anticipated he would be coming out of Georgia. A very unique player, but he's he's okay. Especially in pass protection, someone you're not necessarily going to have to worry about. He'll take his losses, but a solid option at right guard. And then Joe Alt, the rookie right tackle, Such a phenomenal prospect. A lot of parallels have been drawn to what the Detroit Lions did, taking Penny Sewell as a left tackle, flipping him over to right tackle when they already had their left tackle in place, and just creating this foundational tackle duo to build their offense around. And when you pair that with everything we've said about what the Chargers want to do in terms of dictating things at the line of scrimmage, being the tough guys, it makes total sense to bring Joe Alt in here. And as a player, it, you just won't find guys with his size and length profile that are as athletic and as just naturally gifted as a blocker as Joe Alt is. And it, it sounds lazy to say that, but sometimes as you're grinding through all these offensive linemen um, and their tape, you just feel a little differently with some guys in the sense that they just get it. They enjoy the blocking aspect of what they're being asked to do. I think a lot of these guys were told when they were 15 years old, hey, you're an offensive lineman. And they've grown up trying to do the best at that. But I think Joe all truly enjoys what he does and was born to do this. It's... I don't know. It's maybe lazy analysis, but you feel it in in the sense of how quickly he gets off the ball, how accurate he is with his hands, how he's able to somehow maintain really good leverage as a blocker, despite the fact that he is six foot eight. A lot of taller tackles are at a massive disadvantage because defensive players are constantly able to get into his chest and push the guy around and, you know, low man wins and all of that. But Joe Alt lives under the chute. He maintains good pad level, and it's really impressive for a guy that's moving that fast that is that big. And you put all that together, and I think his floor as a run blocker in the NFL is exceptionally high. 
and they should be able to really weaponize him on poles, outside zone sweeps, get him to the second level, and I think you will see some. I wouldn't shy short of saying Trent Williams esque blocks, where you have that dude with freaky traits coming downhill at linebackers and safeties, and he's going to clear the way out in space for the ball carrier. So there's a lot of fun stuff there. Um, now, in terms of pass protection, I, I'm not going to say I'm worried about it, but I think his floor is a lot lower in terms of pass protection. I don't think he's ever really going to suck as a pass blocker, but that is, if anywhere, where you see his height working against him, which, again, is normal for a six foot eight player. I think it is harder when you're more... You know, really, when you're pass blocking, you're in defense mode. And when you're run blocking, you're in attack mode. I think it's harder when you're in defense mode to constantly stay low and win that leverage. And when guys do get into his chest, you'll see him kind of weeble wobble his top. You know, he can get a little top heavy. He will give up some ground on the bull rush. But even then, he has really good reaction time and great technique to reset with his anchor and he resets with his hands to grab on and go for a ride. So even in the losses that he has where he might be registering a pressure because he's getting pushed back into the quarterback, not too often you'll see the guy actually get off of Joe Alt, and he gives the quarterback a chance to do something about it. So you're hoping that translates. And then I do think he actually has room to grow in terms of his pass protection technique. I don't want to say he just wins with athleticism as a pass blocker, but, it, you know, this isn't Rashawn Slater coming out of Northwestern where you saw him as a college prospect, Rashawn Slater mixing up his punches, using different te techniques as a pass blocker. You know, Joe Alt didn't really need to do that in college, so he didn't. It's kind of like the equivalent of, like, Miles Garrett coming out where he didn't have this massive variety of pass rush moves because he didn't need them. Joe Alt could just set, stick his arms on dudes and run his feet. If he's going to be an elite pass protector, you want to see him vary his hand techniques, mix up his sets a little bit more so that guys can't um, take advantage of him. And I expect that those things will happen. So I do love the pick to give Justin Herbert a, you know, potentially like the best tackle duo in the NFL is really what this boils down to. If Joe Alt hits his potential, this is like having the equivalent of Lane Johnson and David Bakhtiari as your tackles. And for a guy like Justin Herbert that doesn't have the best pocket presence, I think over time that could really pay dividends. Even if the gut reaction from a lot of Chargers fans was, man, I really wanted to see Justin Herbert throwing to Malik Neighbors. It's, it's a lot harder to find guys like Joe Alt in the draft. And when you have a quarterback like Justin Herbert, the thinking is he can elevate uh, you know, later drafted wide receivers. But uh, yeah, there's your starting five. Obviously a, a pretty damn solid group, but they have good depth as well. Trey Pipkins, who, you know, I, I hate to keep coming back to the Malik Neighbors thing, but it is relevant. Um, you know, had they gone the other direction and taken the weapon, which would have also been a good decision. I think it was, you know, fork in the road. Couldn't have made a bad choice there. If Trey Pipkins had to be their right tackle again, you could have lived with it. He's been okay. He earned like a three-year, $30 million contract to be kind of a bridge starter at tackle. He's okay as a pass protector. He instantly becomes one of the best backup tackles in the entire NFL. I think when they watched his run block tape, that's when they made the decision to go with Joe Alt because Pipkins really just didn't have the... Kind of the intensity we talked about with Joe Alt, being that natural run blocker, Trey Pipkins was like the opposite, always guessing himself, whiffing on blocks, just really lacking in that department. So he becomes a great backup to have. I also think he could be a guard and just be the perfect swing man. In a typical season, you only see two to four offensive lines in the entire league get through the year healthy. So the most probable outcome is that you – will have weeks where Trey Pipkins can be a very useful backup to step in and you don't miss a beat in terms of pass protection. Then you do have a, a fall off after that. You have Alex Leatherwood, the former first round pick. Uh, for what it's worth, he's been a pretty solid run blocker when he's had to play, but his pass protection is just a non-starter. 
Foster Sorrell made the team last year. Not very noteworthy there. And then I actually like a pair of their interior offensive linemen, Brendan Hamus. I, I wouldn't be stunned if he continues to get better and um, continues to learn the center position. He was a tackle at Nebraska and has been sliding inside. He was a nice player in terms of athleticism and technique, but just lacked the play strength, and that's why he fell in the draft. But if he's bulked up over the last couple of years, he started at the very end of last year and held up very well at center. He has piqued my interest, and that transition to that position makes sense in my mind for him. So someone to at least keep an eye on. And then Jordan McFadden was someone I really liked in the draft who I think has guard tackle flexibility. Maybe not ever going to have starter traits, but thought he was really technically sound and played a million snaps for Clemson and was always a very solid player for them. So I like him as flex depth as well. I think you have eight players on this offensive line that can play, and that really is better than a lot of teams can say. Um, they also get some uh, good help from the skill players, with especially with Will Disley, who is one of the premium blocking tight ends in the NFL. He's a fun watch in terms of putting his dirt, uh, put his putting his hand in the dirt, and flushing out a, a defensive end. So they do get a slight bump to the run blocking there as well. Obviously, the Chargers think that this is going to be a strength of this football team, and and I I tend to agree with them. So let's take a look at the entire offensive picture. They come out as my 22nd ranked offense heading into the year. I think the lack of weaponry and the question marks in terms of the pass game coordination under Greg Roman are the obvious question marks there that drag down the passing game. And then in terms of the run game, they came out 22nd, but very close to like 16th. And that is a massive jump up, frankly, from what they were last year. It was hard to watch this team try and run the ball. And even if they don't have the best running backs and, you know, their their run blocking is, I would say, good, not great at this point in time, this should still be a much more improved run game. And maybe as the year goes on with some of these young additions, guys like Joe Walt and Kamani Vidal and getting to see kind of how they tap into Justin Herbert in the run game, This has potential to be a top half run game in the league, but still some things to answer until that happens. Overall, it should be a very solid offense that is working through some new things as the year goes on. Um, But let's transition to this defense that I'm just going to prep it with this. It's a very porous, um, top heavy defense. I'll I'll say that. Um, Keep an eye out for that as we talk about this. But let's start with the defensive line. And immediately you can see the holes, specifically on the interior of the defensive line. I'm excited to ask Steven about what the hell is going on with this, um, because it's to me it's not a fieldable interior defensive group, and it does drag them down. In fact, um, they rank as the 32nd best or the worst uh, D-line for run defense in the entire league with a D-plus grade. We'll talk about that group a little bit more in just a minute. Um, They are, for me, a B-minus graded pass rush, which is basically smack dab in the middle of the league, 14th to 17th there. And all of that combines to give them, in my opinion, the 26th best defensive line in the league. And like I said, a very top-heavy group. They are almost entirely counting on the success of aging veterans Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa with some nice sprinkles of the young Tuli Tui Pelotu, also off the edge. But I will start with some positivity here Um, and some apologies, frankly, for Chargers fans that have been around the channel. Um, You know, as I was getting through last year, I think I undersold what Khalil Mack was doing. I really do. And I kind of hate that I did that because I've always been such a big Khalil Mack guy. Um, But coming off the heels of 2022, where it did look in his his age 32 season that he had really fallen off, his efficiency fell off a cliff. For whatever reason, as I was watching Khalil Mack last year, watching him rack up sacks and have this monster season that he had last year, truly one of the best years of his career, I had had kind of given him credit for developing this finesse pass rush skill set and kind of 
reshaping his game into something that it hasn't been in years past. I pointed to the six sack Raiders game saying that that was potentially inflating his season, making it look better than it was. I want to take some of that stuff back. Now I, I will say, I think he has developed some different finesse pass rushing moves that have worked well for him that he didn't necessarily have to use in his prime, but especially the point about that Raiders game where he did have six sacks inflating his season. Um, no, man, he he was awesome. And I thoroughly enjoyed getting to dive into some Chargers All-22 and, and focus on him more because he had a complete reversal from, like I said, his first year with the Chargers in 2022. He was lackluster, but last year he was bullying dudes. The bull rush was there. I mentioned the addition of some of these spin moves and swipes and quick hitting pass rush moves that have worked as an addition to his skill set. Sure, he might not have the full-on elite Khalil Mack bull rush that he had in 2017 for the Bears, but there's still a lot of that in there. I mean, he made Ronnie Stanley his bitch against the Ravens, and to steal the name of today's guest, I am guilty as charged that I did not give Khalil Mack the credit he deserved for the season he had last year. I'm doing that now. Um, now, there are still questions with him at 33 years old. Can he repeat that? I I'm not going to bet against him. I have been a massive Khalil Mack fan. He's been one of my favorite players of the decade. I would love to see him do what he did last year again. But five times a bitch, and it catches up with everybody at some point. So it's worth noting that there are some question marks. He is 33 years old. But, man, it was great to see them get the guy that they thought they were trading for a year before. And then Joey Bosa on the other side. Not quite as positive of a conversation there. Kind of similar to what we said about J.K. Dobbins earlier. Not to the same degree, but, like, even if he's healthy, I don't know that he's the same Joey Bosa that we knew and loved. I just don't see a lot of quick twitch there. I don't see the same power. And the efficiency over the last two years just has not been there. And even me giving him an 83 grade here for this series, that's saying he's like a low-end number one. Frankly, even when he's played, he's been much closer to a high-end number two than any sort of number one. And then you factor in the fact that, I mean, how many games are you going to get from him at this point? He, uh, from my understanding, willingly took a pay cut, which is really cool. I mean, maybe there's a part of him that's been like, you know what? I haven't returned my value to this organization. Maybe I should take a pay cut. Maybe it's him betting on himself. I, I don't fully know. But um, yeah, it's I don't want to be all negative. He's still a good player when he's out there, but... He's more name than he is superstar at this point. And there is um, almost a more likely than not scenario that Tui Tui Pelotu is the better edge rusher for this team, certainly the more productive one in terms of availability. Not only does he not have massive injury questions, but he's a really good player. They stole him in the second round, made a couple teams look foolish for taking other edge rushers ahead of him, teams like the Chiefs with... Uh, Felix and Aduke Uzama, the Saints with Isaiah Foskey. Uh, Thule was substantially better than those guys, and he was straight up one of the better run-defending edge players in the entire league. He is a menace up front. He's, he's 265 pounds, um, so he's tough to move, but he also has lightning-quick feet. That's what I liked about him coming out, is you just don't see guys that big with the lateral agility that he has, and he's able to you know sh slip and shed blocks really well when guys do come his way. So he sets a hard edge and can get off blocks. But that very much shows in his rush style as well, where he's got swims and spins and swipes and a, a very good finesse pass rushing skill set. I compared him to, Z to Zadarius Smith. I think we saw those flashes, someone that they'll also walk up as a stand-up rush linebacker so that they can get all three of these guys on the field. He's really effective at that. Hopefully this new regime continues to tap into that. But even his power as a bull rush flashed more than I thought it would as a, as a rookie. So I see a guy that can be a, a really good number two in time. 
I don't know if he's quite the athlete in terms of straight line explosiveness to be like an elite number one type of guy, but certainly within the construction of this team as a compliment to Khalil Mack and a compliment to Joey Bosa when he's healthy, he's awesome. And I think in time, he's going to be a really good starter for them. And then they did sign Bud Dupree. He's going to be a smasher, an early down run defender. Um, you know, he's been an overrated pass rusher for a long time at this point, but they're not asking him to really do that. So it's fine for what they signed him to, to do. Chris Rumpf has played some adequate snaps for this team um, to round out their edge room, which is one of the better edge rooms in the entire league, which is funny when you compare it to their interior defensive line. And even their best interior defensive lineman is a hybrid end who can't really play run defense on early downs unless you're in like a base 3-4 and he's a 4-I kind of split in a gap. And that's Morgan Fox. Um, I list him as a rotational starter for that reason. He's, um, you know, a unique player to try and get on the field. But he is a very useful pass rusher. He's a handful for player uh, for offensive linemen to handle. Really great, great quickness, a good bull rush. He's got some um, lateral agility to slip by guys. He's been a pretty consistent, you know, 45 pressure, eight sack guy on the inside as a really good complimentary piece. So he'll still be here for that role. But um, man, in terms of the actual defensive tackles on this team, holy woof. They signed Puna Ford who three years ago I really liked as a fourth or fifth piece, a number two defensive tackle for the Seattle Seahawks, an interesting player where he's, he's like 5'11", 310 pounds, so you, you really struggle to move the guy, but he can't always see into the backfield when he does create run stops. He kind of has to guess because, you know, if you're going to stack peak shed, the peak aspect of that matters, and when he goes to peak, there's just not enough of him to look around a big offensive lineman. And you've seen that really be reflected in his effectiveness and, and over time, his his playing time. Now he's got a nice first step. He can do some stuff as a pass rusher. You know, you trot him out there next to Bosa and Mack and Thule and Morgan Fox. He might have a nice five, six sack season and be a capable piece of this pass rush. But when he is your best run defender on the inside, that's a joke. And then the fall off from him is colossal. None of these guys have proven anything. Otito Ogbanya is potentially slated to get the most playing time after Puna Ford. I'm not excited about that. He is a straight line sledgehammer. He's got really good size and an, and an adequate bull rush, but has no idea what he's doing when it comes to finding the ball in the run game. That was his problem at UCLA, and it's held him back from becoming a force for the Chargers in two years here. Um, Scott Matlock is a, is a fun player, but extremely light and undersized. He's kind of like a long-term potential replacement for someone like a Morgan Fox, or if he can bulk up and learn how to defend the run, uh, you might get something there. But for him to be in the mix for significant early down playing time is not great. He will get moved around. Justin Aboigby same deal, undersized guy. He plays at about 290 pounds. He's got discipline. He's got the ability and technique to defend the run. But asking him to play in between the guards? No, that's that's not who he is, and that's not really why the Chargers should have drafted him. And I don't think that is why they drafted him. Honestly, in my opinion, potentially the two best run defenders on this team might be Christopher Hinton, who came out early out of Michigan, I think still only 23 or 24 years old. I, I liked his raw shed strength, was surprised he didn't get drafted. And then Gerard Clark, who was a raw tool, toolsy nose tackle out of Coastal Carolina. Honestly, those two guys might be the best run defenders on this team for the interior of the D-line. So two guys to keep an eye on. I like that they're here, but the fact that they're borderline counting on those guys to step up is rough. So I like the pass rush. I think it's it's above average. And if Joey Bosa can stay healthy, frankly, this is more of a top 10 pass rush. I'll be honest. They got dinged for Joey Bosa's health. They would have been a B grade, but I lowered it to a B minus when I factored in Joey Bosa's health. Um, but yeah, I like this this group from a pass rush perspective. But if the 
idea of this Chargers team is, you know, we're going to be a more physical team. We're going to set the tone at the line of scrimmage, um, run the ball, and in theory defend the run as well. Um, I think that's really the position group where you look at their offseason and say, well, they just they ran out of ammo. They couldn't fix everything at once. And I think for this year's Chargers team, they might even be taking a step back in terms of run defense, something that they've been so god awful at over the years. Teams will get off the bus and say, great, we can just smash these dudes up front. And again, that has cost the Chargers countless games over the years. So it's it's a major concern for me. And having good run defenders on the edge like Bosa and Mack and Thule can only go so far to help you against that. But let's talk about the linebackers. They don't grade out all that well because you have a third-round rookie and a guy in Denzel Perriman who, again, you're sensing a theme now at this point, has struggled to stay healthy. This is going to turn into one of the major question marks on the Chargers is all these guys that they went after that have been injury-prone, can they stay on the field? Um, but they rank with a C overall grade for linebacker, tied for 27th. Worse off in terms of coverage, with a C minus grade for linebacker coverage, 27th to 30th. And then for linebacker run defense, a little bit better, tied for 22nd with a C plus grade. So definitely putting an emphasis on the run defense first with this group. And while they rank obviously fairly low there, I, I do see some long-term upside in this room, and that does, of course, start with third-round pick Junior Colson. I mean, look, the Chargers had the 37th pick in this draft. If that would have been Junior Colson, I would have celebrated it, it then. He was my LB1, and the fact that they were able to get him in the third round is fantastic. Uh, no better home for him, obviously, just getting to run Jesse Minner's defense coming straight over from Michigan. It's a really unique and cool thing here for all the time I spend dunking on rookie linebackers and how stupid they are relative to guys that have been in the league for four or five years. Junior Colson is going to know this defense better than anybody in the building, not named Jesse Minter. So really cool for that to be a rookie and for him to be a true building block for this defense. And his tape was really good, man. He's a really he's he the reason he was my LB1 is you just don't get a lot of linebackers these days coming out of college that were actually asked to do pro style stuff. And obviously that was a pro style defense at Michigan. They would have him drop into true coverage um assignments. They asked him to go through his run keys, play with discipline, maintain his cap. It sounds silly, but so many linebackers and so many linebacker prospects in college football, it's see ball, hit ball, run and chase. Don't worry about a lot of stuff. Third down, you're either blitzing or on a QB spy. Not Junior Colson. He did all the stuff at Michigan that they're going to ask him to do here, and that's really cool. I think out the gate, he is a better run defender than he is a coverage player. He's a smart coverage player, but just not quite there yet. He's very young. And he's also not a superb athlete. That was the knock on him. But I just I think athleticism at the linebacker position gets overrated a lot of the times. I'd rather have the guy that's a good athlete that actually knows what he's doing. And that's Junior Colson. So he's going to have to prove himself. But I believe in him. I believe in his upside. And I believe in him working out as a very capable starter. And someone that maybe someday could be a top 10 linebacker in the league. He's got a very balanced profile. One of my favorite picks in this entire draft. And then you have Denzel Perriman next to him. And and look, I, I love Denzel Perriman, but how many games are you getting from him? He throws his body around. He's a smasher. He's aggressive. He's one of the better run-defending linebackers, frankly, in the league when he's healthy and 100%. And that just is half the season, typically. That's followed him even to when he was younger. So... I like that he's here, but I just can't count on 17 games of Denzel Perriman. And maybe that's a best case scenario where you're not relying on guy and a guy like Diane Henley to be a starter, but because he's going to get opportunities to show you what he can do while also having to compete for that job, um, you can 
you know, really unlock a guy like Dion Henley, if that makes sense. Henley was, as well, a really good third-round pick for the Chargers last year. Someone that I loved as a, you know, used to play wide receiver, really understood the coverage aspects of the position. Obviously, having played wide receiver, a really fluid mover, but the play strength aspects of the position were lacking for him. Not necessarily all-around run defense. He has a quick trigger. He's a good tackler. He's got good length. There's stuff to like from him in terms of run defense. But that's why you put him next to Junior Colson, who's a full-size 240 pounds. And there is a world where Junior Colson plus Diane Henley two years from now is a superstar linebacker duo. I love those complementary skill sets for this room. But for 2024, it's it's just really hard to expect that to be the case. And then last year, when they did have injuries, instead of turning to Diane Henley, they actually went to Nick Neiman, who was a hyper-athletic guy coming out of Iowa, went really late in the draft, like fifth or sixth round, and he actually played pretty well when he got his, got his opportunities last year as well. So in terms of having interesting, high upside bodies in a linebacker room where these guys are going to kind of compete, and I don't think Denzel Perriman is locked in as the starter if either Neiman or Henley earn it in camp after being forced to earn it, I think that could be healthy for this team, and especially the long term. So while this group ranks low and they're unproven, I, I actually like the position room and think maybe by the end of the year or, or by the end of next year, we're looking back on this and saying, wow, they, they did a really good job with this group. And then not really any other names to focus on after that. Uh, Troy Dye has played a little bit in Minnesota, but really just a special teamer there. But let's go to the secondary it's an okay group, but again, an incredibly thin group. You have injury-prone starters on the D-line at linebacker, and then in the secondary, if anybody does get hurt, there's nobody that you're counting on to step in here. So I'd be lying if I said that's not a concern. But um, in terms of the starters, four out of five look really good. I mean, Asante Samuel, I'm... I'm like okay with as your number one corner. I think still ideally he'd be number two as a guy that he does get beat. He's a total risk taker. He he has a little bit of that Trayvon Diggs in him where he, he's got such great awareness for the position. He's got such great hands that he, he can kind of leave a little extra space at times intentionally, try to bait you into a throw, make that big play, um, but it can – can and, and will lead to him giving up a lot of yards. And, and Asante Samuel over the last couple of years um, has given up a lot of passing yards, but he's also towards the top in terms of pass breakups and plays on the ball. So he's that type of corner. And I don't mind that, but ideally you'd have a number one that is a little bit more sticky in coverage, and then you're funneling targets towards the playmaker in Asante Samuel. But even as your number one, I think he's a, he's a good playmaker and, and a good player to have. And then they signed Christian Fulton. Really underwhelming tape last season. I, I like Christian Fulton, but he was kind of burnt toast last year. I think he has better football in him than that. I don't know all of the reasons why he was so bad last year but he was available for cheap for a reason but I still see him as a technically sound player and an adequate starter someone that can be a band-aid for them if nothing else but his his contract is a reflection of how poorly he played last year he got a one-year prove-it deal for 2.8 million that's very low so still just 26 years old again I think there's potentially better football ahead of him uh, ahead for him but in many ways, a prove-it year. Um, and then their slot corner is a massive question mark. It's Jasir Taylor, another spot where I think you look at the offseason and you're like, yeah, I wish they could have invested more in getting a, a good slot corner in there, but it just didn't land that way. Taylor played a large chunk of last season, and from a coverage perspective, was hit or miss, to put it lightly. Ended the year kind of in and out of the lineup. But he did have eight pass breakups on the season, had some good starts against teams like the Jets and the Bears. So he's not a complete lost cause, but to count on him as your starting slot is very, like, just questionable. 
a sixth round pick in 2022. And um, honestly, his run defense is frustratingly bad. Not only is he undersized and struggles to get off blocks, but he missed 23 and a half percent of his tackle attempts last year. That's that's just brutal. So ideally, you'd have someone better in the slot. But as you look at their depth, I, I don't see who that would be. I mean, Cam Hart is a an outside only corner coming out of Notre Dame. Uh, Chargers fans are very familiar with Michael Davis. Cam Hart is in that family of the lengthy press man corner. Not a ton of athleticism, frankly, but he's tough. And if anybody in this cornerback room is going to fill in and, and step up in the event of an injury or, or maybe even be better than someone like Christian Fulton, that might be a stretch. But um, I, I think it would be Cam Hart. Uh, Tarheeb still was also a fifth-round pick with Cam Hart. I didn't watch his tape, so I'm open to the possibility that um, – the Chargers found some diamond in the rough out of Maryland there. I guess we'll just have to kind of wait and see what he can do. They have Dean Leonard, who's been on this team for a couple of years, has never done much. It's um, it's needless to say a group that they're probably going to need to invest more in in the future. Now, the safety duo is really good. You have Aloe Gilman, who had a bit of a breakout year last year. I think one of the underrated players certainly on this team and maybe around the league I, I didn't think he would ever become this good of a player coming out of Notre Dame because he just he didn't test well. He doesn't have the speed. But he has totally made up for the lack of speed that he has uh, with incredible anticipation and zone IQ, football awareness, whatever you want to call it. He's just got those playmaking instincts, man. He, he collapses downfield when a lot of safeties are just overly conservative and don't trigger on stuff. He loves to hit. He's got ball skills. He rips the ball out. He made some sensational plays for this Chargers team last year and earned a contract extension. And honestly, two years, $10 million, probably underpaid for what he did last year. A consistent run defender coming down field as well. He's a nice player, man. Very much in line with... Um, what this sort of Ravens-oriented scheme had last year in Geno Stone, who did a lot of good stuff on the back end and I think led the league in interceptions last year. So should be another good year for Aloe Gilman, who's been, again, a really nice, pleasant surprise for this Chargers team. Um, and then Derwin. Look, I'm a, I'm a huge Derwin James fan. I've got a jersey. He's on the banner for my channel. He is that enforcing safety that is an aesthetic that I think every football fan gravitates towards. But um, the idea of Derwin James really over the last couple of years has been better in theory than it has been on the field, especially in terms of coverage. But how much of that was Brandon Staley forcing this Fangio style defense on this team and just using Derwin as a, rotation, you know, up and down split safety in that two shell defense. That's not how you use Derwin James. You know how you should use Derwin James in the Kyle Hamilton role, strong safety linebacker, blitzing slot corner, keep him within 10 to 15 yards of the line of scrimmage where his length and physicality and instincts can be a complete weapon for you. And Hello, Ravens staff coming in, Kyle Hamilton roll, you put two and two together, Derwin James is actually going to be on my breakout list for this upcoming season, something I hope to publish at some point before the year starts. If they're able to put him in that specific spot, I will not shy short of saying that he could be what Kyle Hamilton is, straight up. And that's not an insult to Kyle Hamilton, that's reminding you all like it's Derwin freaking James. There's no reason he should have been as unproductive as he's been in the Brandon Staley era, but there is one hold up there and that is, well, who the hell else is playing safety? Because if you're going to use Derwin in the Kyle Hamilton role, you need two guys on the back end, right? Baltimore had Geno Stone and Marcus Williams. And then they used Kyle Hamilton just all over the place. And if they're going to use Derwin that way, I mean, you're counting on JT Woods. Um, it's possible. JT Woods was a freak coming out of Baylor. He's got ball skills. He runs in the four threes. He, in theory, 
could make for a very good free safety. You use Aloe Gilman as the kind of do-it-all Geno Stone guy, and then Derwin is your Kyle Hamilton. I pray that that's what we get here because not only do those roles all make sense and allows you to really replicate what this team wants to do, looking at that Ravens defense, but that's also going to get Jasir Taylor off the field, right? But at this point in time, that is entirely counting on JT Woods, and that's when I look at the Chargers and I'm like, man, can you make one more play to go get a safety? Can you go out and get a Quandre Diggs or a Micah Hyde or a Justin Simmons to be a deep safety that allows Derwin to come downfield? Um, I'm, I'm honestly begging the Chargers to do that because I almost view it as a non-negotiable variable for this defense to really work this year because I would bet against JT Woods looking good enough for them to feel confident to put him back there and not blow assignments on the back end and miss a bazillion tackles as he's done. I I like putting a veteran in there that JT Woods is going to have to work for that job. And my Lord, it is not Tony Jefferson. It's just not. To me, them signing Tony Jefferson is them saying he's going to be the Kyle Hamilton role, whereas Derwin is going to be kind of the movable strong safety and then a Loey Gilman will be the free safety. I just don't think that's his ideal. And that's not to disrespect that AJ Finley might get into the mix here, but come on. That's what I really want to see. I'm still going to put the up arrow on Derwin James and call my shot on the breakout and just pray that they do go get a free safety or that JT Woods emerges there. But uh, it does it does muddy the waters there a, a little bit. So when putting this all together the defense actually came out really poor for me, 30th in the league. I don't know how controversial that's going to be or not, but, man, the holes are rough. There are some very severe weaknesses on this defense, especially when you look at the run defense. I'm worried about it, man. I just am. As much as this team wants to preach toughness and physicality and discipline, can that transcend, frankly, garbage roster talent with the most important position for run defense being the interior of the defensive line? I, I don't know that it can. So you pair that with um, a shaky, unproven linebacker duo, and, and that's where you get the 32nd run defense in the league. And, and unproven coaching as well <laughs> certainly doesn't help there. In terms of pass defense, it's, it's better. You have the groundwork of an adequate secondary and a, a, a good pass rush. Definitely worried, though, about some of the intermediate pass defense with the linebackers in the slot corner and some of the lack of safety depth. And then again, that pass game coaching is just going to have to, um, you know, prove prove itself out. If this team can stay healthy, I think they could be around a top 24 defense. But especially on this side of the ball, I, I see a lot of holes. And and if and when those injuries start to stack up, it, it could get ugly for a year um, until they're able to get younger and, and get more durable on this side of the ball and get some damn big boys in the middle of the D-line, please. Now, we do get to finish with some massive positivity on the special teams. I have to, like, pinch myself looking at this with the Chargers being the number one ranked special teams. Wow, we've come a long way. It it was a meme for like five years, like death taxes and the Chargers having a joke of a special teams. And here they are using, um, for the most part, objective metrics, things like PFF team grade, DVOA team grade, kicker grade, punter grade, and then a little bit of subjectivity using my overall team and coach and culture ranking. But it spits out the Chargers as the best special teams in the league. And that starts with the kicker. Cam Dicker, the kicker, was phenomenal last season. Missed just a handful of kicks and has been good since he got to L.A. No reason to believe that'll drop off, knock on wood. Um, J.K. Scott has a boot on him. He's been very good as well. You've got Darius Davis as a featured kick returner and punt returner who's one of the better punt returners in the league last year and clearly a coverage unit that somehow really stepped up last year we bang on this team for a lack of depth but they covered kicks man so not a ton of reason to believe this is going to change they might not be number one again but same special teams coordinator a lot of the same bodies and and even an influx of 
good coaching and discipline and an emphasis on special teams. You know, Jim's brother, John, is one of the legendary special teams coaches around the league. So an elite ranking, at least in one phase of the game for this Chargers team. Um, Let's recap, taking a look at this team's strengths and weaknesses and their schedule before we get to the interview with Steven and the Guilty as Charged podcast. Strengths, quarterback, a massive strength, offensive line. They have some good stuff to work with on the offensive side of the ball. Special teams, as we noted, a strength for this team. And then, hey, they finally have an adult running the team in Jim Harbaugh. But a handful of weaknesses on this team, the worst ranked group of weapons. What is the play design in the passing game going to look like under Greg Roman? The interior of the defensive line that we harped on, the depth in the secondary, they are an injury away from being really rough there. And just overall, especially on the defense, they are a wildly injury-prone football team, very much playing with fire with some of the players they are hoping can stay healthy this year. Then we take a look at the schedule. It is actually a very favorable schedule for the Chargers. The AFC West is the weakest of the AFC divisions, and they get to play the NFC South, the weakest of the NFC divisions. On top of that, they get the fourth place schedule, which lands them the Patriots, the Titans, two teams we've already revealed in this series, and the Cardinals. Very winnable games for them. And then they do have to play the AFC North, which is a potential world beater this year. So that's not great. Very much looking forward to that Week 12 Harbaugh versus Harbaugh grudge match. But um, for a team that we were pretty harsh on, I think the schedule is very favorable. Now, I still think the odds on this team are a little hefty. An eight and a half win total does feel rich for me. I mean, do I really think this is a nine and eight football team with the schedule? It's certainly possible, but they're going to need a lot of things to go right. They're going to need to stay healthy in a lot of spots. And then to me, I mean, 40 to one Super Bowl odds. That seems like a waste of money. I mean, this team is not complete enough this year to win the Super Bowl. I obviously have them ranked a good bit lower than that, um, 25th in our rankings. The over-under, on the other hand, is is more obtainable. Um, but I, I think I would actually bet the under on this. I think the Chargers are much closer to a 7 or an 8-win team than they are a 9 or a 10-win team, which is what they need to hit that over. I believe in the future of this team. I loved their offseason. They're heading in the right direction. But as we broke down here, there's a lot of holes on this team, and a lot of certain matchups are really going to be able to pick on this team. Effectively having no wide receivers and no interior defensive line can catch up to a to a team. <laughs> um, and I expect that to plague them at points throughout the season. But that is going to do it for just my side of things. We are going to turn things over to the interview with Steven of the Guilty as Charged podcast, one of my favorite guests every year. I hope you guys don't go anywhere and stick around for this. You're not going to want to miss it. And now I am thrilled to welcome back for yet another year, Steven Hagland of the Guilty as Charged podcast, one of my favorite interviews every year. So good to see you, Steven. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. Uh, super happy to uh, carry on the tradition. I think this is our fifth year doing this uh, deep dive on the Chargers, so um you were one of the first content creators i got to meet online and we've managed to you know maintain a a close you know relationship if you will and uh super excited to be back on the show this year yeah one it's been really cool i I feel like both both sides we've kind of grown a lot since we started Mm -hmm. doing this i mean you guys are freaking on the field at (laughs) minicamp for the chargers you guys are absolutely legit so it's an honor to uh have have you and the guilty as charged show join us here Uh, unfortunately for the chargers in your time coming it's been a dip and a dip and a dip and a yeah. dip every yeah, yeah, yeah. year. Um, what are your impressions when you hear tw- 25th ranked LA chargers? Is that <laughs> what, what do you, what's your gut reaction to, to see in that ranking? Uh, I thought it was a little harsh, but I, I can understand why I think, you know, chargers fans uh, after hiring Jim Harbaugh and after having, you know, nailing the draft and and having a good free agency to a certain extent, depending on how you view the Keenan Allen trade. Mm -hmm. A lot of Chargers fans are, are completely sipping the Kool-Aid 
And there are still some like national media members who have them kind of in the same range that you do. I'm kind of in the middle there. Like some Chargers fans don't like that we are predicting kind of like 10 and 7, 9 and 8 this year. Um, while, you know, the national media is kind of like, well, the roster is just in this terrible shape. And so I'm kind of in the mix there. But, mm -hmm. you know, if I went through the whole list, I'd probably have them in like the 18 to 20 range. So I don't think it's like that crazy yeah. but 25 is is a little harsh for me i was stunned um i don't actually check like the super bowl odds too much until i start to put the series together and i was stunned yeah. they were like 15th in super odds i, I was like yeah so it's, it's a little rich with all the holes on this team but uh let's get into it uh talk about gut reactions i was curious like what's your gut reaction when you see the news come across jim harbaugh is the head coach of the chargers how did you feel when that came in uh, gut reaction was a uh, shock. Uh, I never really actually thought that he was going to leave Michigan. Um, I kind of had the the belief that I would believe it when I saw it happen. Um, you know, Harbaugh's obviously done the the flirting with the NFL thing for years uh, leading up until this point. So I never really thought that it was a realistic option. Um, I, I just felt like he was more likely to stay in Michigan, especially coming off the national championship. Like once they won the championship, I was like, oh, he's staying. Like either you can't just leave after a national championship. Um, once you get past the shock, though, I think it was just the, the perfect time to hire a Jim Harbaugh because, you know, the Chargers have been such a finesse team for mm – -hmm my whole life as a fan outside of a few years yeah. of Marty Schottenheimer when I was like a child. Um, so you go through like <laughs> this, especially coming off of the Brandon Staley regime. I think there's no better like pressure washer cleaning than you could hire than Jim Harbaugh and Greg Roman and Jesse Minter and these guys. So I think it's exactly what the team needs. Joe Ortiz, I think brings a lot of that as well to the front office. So I think, you know, once you get past the shock or the excitement, if you thought that this was happening all along, which some Chargers fans did, um, you just understand that it it's just the perfect time. There's a lot of quirks about Jim Harbaugh, but for the Chargers and this specific era and moment, there's no better coach than Jim Harbaugh for what they need and kind of facelift that they uh, needed to undergo. Yeah, it's going to be like a total mental reset required because you think of the chargers and the baby blues and it's like, <laughs> you know, finesse is a great way to put it, but yeah, they're, they're trying to become the Baltimore Ravens, which have a, a completely different aesthetic about it. So I, I can't yeah. wait to see it um, on that note as well. The Greg Roman news comes in. How did you feel about that? Cause I know if I was a chargers fan, that would have been a little bit of a knockoff on my <laughs> excitement, just a little bit, just, yeah, a little bit of a nepotism hire, a little bit of too old school, maybe. How do you feel about Greg Roman coming in? I, I feel okay about the hire. Yeah. I think you know the whole emphasis of the offseason was like we want to establish our identity, and Greg Roman obviously gets you to that point. Uh, you know, leading into the process, once they hired Harbaugh, I like I would have been okay with the hire. I didn't like how they handled the hiring process because they only interviewed one other candidate, at least that we know publicly, they can always interview candidates and not leak them out. But mm -hmm. uh, the only other candidate they interviewed was Marcus Brady, who is on the staff as the passing game coordinator. But there were several other coaches with ties to Harbaugh that I thought were more intriguing. You know, Tanner Engstrand from Detroit, obviously being potentially like the number one candidate there. And I thought that that could have been the best of both worlds of, hey, we're going to bring in like this physical Harbaugh identity, but also a modern NFL passing game yeah. that Angstrand has been around. Um, there were some others. Um, I forget his name with the Saints right now. Uh, he's the quarterback's coach, Ronald Curry. Um, okay. He's another one that I thought was like potentially intriguing. Same kind of idea. So it, it does feel a little disappointing just with the process that they went through to hire to get to that point with Greg Roman. But overall, I think it's it's kind of, uh, again, the timing is right for Greg Roman to reunite with Jim Harbaugh more so than like potentially with this roster. I know a lot of Justin Herbert fans hated it. Um, but I, I think with where the roster is at, I think Greg Roman is, is, is a good, good coach is the right time for him to join up back up with Jim Harbaugh. Have you 
obviously being so close with the team, have have you been able to pick up any breadcrumbs in terms of just how much of a kind of Ravens heavy 12 personnel, 13 personnel heavy offense this might be? Or do you think there is some hope that they'll be able to kind of thread the needle a little bit? And maybe you don't, maybe you just have no idea and you're just guessing. But, <laughs> um, what are your kind of expectations for uh, schematically what this could look like? They're saying publicly that it's not going to be as drastic of a run heavy split as it was with the Ravens. And I think part of that is that Herbert is not the runner that Lamar was mm -hmm. right. So there's this huge chunk of the Greg Roman playbook of the quarterback run game that, I mean, Justin Herbert can run, but he actively does not like to do it. Mm. So that part of the playbook, I think is just going to transition more into like an RPO kind of world. So I don't think it's going to be full 50, 50 split, but it's definitely not going to be like the 70 30 split that it's been over the past couple of seasons under Brandon Staley. That is for sure. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about is selfish. I wanted to bring you on and talk about Justin Herbert because of all the things that I get hate for on Twitter right now, I think <laughs> it is that I am this massive Justin Herbert hater. I ranked him sixth for the purposes of this series fifth for passing grade and sixth for overall quarterback. Am I a Justin Herbert hater? And uh, where are you at? Like, where would you rank Justin Herbert in terms of, I guess, just his, you know, overall quarterback ranking in the league? No, I, I don't think six classifies you as a hater. I, I think, you know, it, depending on how you feel about certain other quarterbacks and, you know, if your main argument is, is going to be talking about wins, which I know it's not on this show, but like generally you, like if your main thing is like, well, Herbert hasn't won enough. I don't really care about your opinion. I think that's kind of yeah. the worst place to start quarterback discourse. Um, but if you're just, if you're looking about like, depending on how you feel about CJ Stroud, depending on how you feel about Jordan Love, Matthew Stafford, uh, you know, and his age and things like that. I think the the ceiling for Herbert right now is probably fourth, I would say. Um, you know, so if you have him in that four to seven range, I'm more than okay with it. You know, I, I saw a list where he was like 12th and like, that's just, <laughs> that's just ridiculous. Yes. Like, there's, Someone <laughs> there's just... lower than me. <laughs> <laughs> or like, uh, Colin Coward and Nick Wright did like a quarterback draft and Herbert was like 11th. It's like, okay, like, yeah. okay, we've gone too far. And Nick Wright took like Caleb Williams second, which was ridiculous. But, yeah. um, I think six is fine. Like, I don't think that classifies you as a hater. I would probably like right off the top of my head, you know, having you, you said this to me today, but I would probably have him at fifth um, because I do think like the lack of playoff success does matter somewhat. Like if you're breaking a tie between him and Joe Burrow, like, I'm sorry, like I'm going to put the guy who went to a Super Bowl with the worst offensive line in the league ahead of him, not by a ton, but. I think objectively Mahomes and Josh Allen are one and two, and then it's like mm -hmm. everybody else kind of fighting for pecking orders after that. Well, and I think we've talked about this in the past, um, and I really try to make an emphasis on like collecting clips of this for this video here, but yeah, it's not so much the he doesn't win, but there's a, a situational it factor kind of missing a little bit with Herbert in terms of the pocket feel getting those high percentage looks on third down consistently, that is kind of what leaves him behind. Um, I guess my last Herbert question is, do you see the same thing in terms of kind of a general lack of pocket feel relative to the other elite quarterbacks? I mean, I think Herbert is one of the best in the league at avoiding sacks, yes. which obviously does come with like pocket presence. But I think the thing with Herbert is that, he is so prone to, I need to avoid a mistake. And that mm. is something that really got drilled into him as a rookie by Anthony Lynn. And also at Oregon, like it was like, you know, if you make a mistake, then we're screwed. Mm. But if you take the punt, we're fine. Like we can survive. And I think there is a lot of that that is still stuck in him. So there, there definitely are moments where I would like to see him be more of an aggressive playmaker. Yeah. But when it when that switch does flip on, he's one of the three best quarterbacks yeah. in the league. Like I think if you really watch 
the games like the Detroit Lions game from last year, the Ravens game from last year, you know, the Pittsburgh Steelers from a couple of years ago, their first win at Arrowhead. There are games where playmaking wise, he is right there with, with Josh Allen. I'm not, Mahomes is in his own tier in that regard, but yeah. I think there is a world where if Justin was just more consistently aggressive, he could be in that Josh Allen conversation in terms of creativity. So I think it's a fair criticism, but he avoids sacks at such a high level that there's kind of a middle ground there too. Yeah. Because you look at some of these other quarterbacks who might be a little bit more like aggressive playmakers, but they take sacks at a really, really high rate. Like I love Lamar yep. Jackson, but his sack rate is really, really high because he's too aggressive. So there's a bit of give and take there, but I think Herbert, you can live with it because he doesn't take sacks like some of these other quarterbacks. And yeah. hopefully, ideally, the Chargers have not the worst defense in the league and punting isn't like the worst thing in the world anymore. Yeah, man, I, I would just love to see him like take that consistent leap and be that dude. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously it's a tough there, nuance. It's just not every single week. Yeah, it's a hard nuanced conversation because like other than sack rate, which I agree with you, I think like when the pressure gets in quickly, he's so good at like seeing it yeah. and do something about it. It's more of that like natural feel when plays break down that he's just kind of like, I don't want to call him timid, yeah. but just doesn't quite have that it factor. Is, is yeah. kind of And I, I am curious there. about, you know, one of the big things for like, and we can talk about this too, is the playmakers around him. If Keenan Allen was not getting open in a scramble drill, he was mm -hmm. not throwing the football. Like yeah. there was nobody else, uh, kind of Austin Eckler a little bit, but Austin Eckler was never like, that wasn't his game either. But so it is going to be so curious to see who develops the trust with Justin in scramble situations, because it was, okay, I'm scrambling. Keenan's not open. Okay. I'm running or I'm throwing the football. Yeah. Away. And yeah. It's such trust is such an important thing with Justin Herbert. I think it's a really underrated aspect of him. Like I think from a fantasy perspective, I think a lot of people are fading Josh Palmer for the wrong reasons because him and Justin have such a great connection together that yeah. Lad McConkey, the rookie, Quentin Johnston, DJ Chark, these guys just don't have. So that is something I'm just so curious to see who becomes that trust receiver that Justin Herbert needs. And right now it, kind of probably is josh palmer well that might be the answer to my next question but i i wanted to ask you where, where is the fantasy value on this offense and why is it kamani vidal but <laughs> <laughs> a good one i i would say that Vidal is more of like the upside swing yeah um you know value wise though i do think it is josh palmer i i don't think he has a ton of like wide receiver one upside and there's injury concerns here as well um, but if you take out the games where Mike Williams played and Josh Palmer did play, Joshua Palmer was like a top 20 ish wide receiver mm -hmm. in fantasy football. And as well as like yards per route run first downs created stuff like that. So I think it is Josh Palmer. And then I think it's Lad McConkey. Like I, I, I think Lad is going to have a real role in from a creative touch standpoint. Uh, Greg Roman spoke about this recently, actually that, they, they think Lad can be a gadget guy as well as a design touch guy, as well as potentially like a future wide receiver one. Like Greg Roman yeah. loves Lad McConkey. I think for this year, though, I think that trust with Herbert and Palmer is just that much. I'm definitely staying away from the tight ends. I'm staying away from the running backs like as much as you possibly can because I think Gus Edwards, he'll have the touchdowns. So that maybe could be like a value standpoint, but I, I don't see him getting like, 18 carries a game like i think it's gonna be a pretty even split between him and then whoever wins like the jk dobbins kamani but all battle i think there's gonna be a yeah. 50 50 split in the running back uh backfield cool yeah i love to hear that because i i feel like i i may have been one of those people that undersold josh palmer and i i 100 agree with the chemistry like he is a high high iq receiver like that is what yeah. has made him essentially relevant um yeah and, and, I mean and he plays he worshiped keenan allen like he mm. he was picking keenan allen's brain every single day and there's like some moments like from a route running perspective where you're watching josh palmer you're like man that looks like keenan allen from 2017 a bit here yeah i feel like when you're not moving that fast sometimes routes can look really nice because <laughs> <laughs> again i'm hating on josh palmer but it's like a um, four or five he, guy <laughs> well you see it with like drake london i think like when you're not yeah 
a, when you're not blazing speed, you can really change directions a little easier. So I think I think that helps him a little bit. Um, but let's talk about the defense a little bit. Sure. Dude, the, the defensive line is a joke. Like the interior of the defensive line, what is going on there? Like they have to sign somebody, right? They I'm looking at this group and I'm like, okay, so you you have Puna Ford and then all projects. Is this really the group they're going to roll out here, you think? Or are you expecting another signing here? Um, I don't know if I'm expecting a signing before the season. Uh, I do think it is something like midseason that they could look at. The, the Chargers do have a pretty manageable schedule to open. So mm-hmm. if they're 6-3, and three, we've talked about this on our show, we could definitely see Joe Ortiz going out and saying, hey, like we need a defensive tackle difference maker. Like Let's go get one on the trade market. I think that is a real possibility but they have like a hundred million dollars in cap space next year they have a lot of draft picks coming in from the the compensatory pick formula so it feels like it's a let's throw a bunch of options at the wall we'll see if anything sticks and if nothing sticks yeah we'll figure it out next year i will say um they love justin eboigby they had jim harbaugh and Joe Ortiz both said they had a second round grade on him coming out. And again, that could just be like coach speak, GM speak. And like they drafted the guy. Um, I, I liked his run defense. I thought that it was a good fit, you know, from a fourth round perspective. Um, they do also have Morgan Fox, who is an awesome, super efficient pass rusher. Right. But yeah, it, it's a lot of question marks. Like I, I think, you know, uh, Nate Tice always talks about like the spine of the defense on, mm-hmm. on the athletic football shows. Now the Yahoo sports shows and the spine is a big concern for the chargers defense. I, and I'm right there with you, but it's a lot of question marks. If Justin Boyby can hit, if Puna Ford can play like 2021 Puna Ford, if Otito Gonia can go back to his rookie season and Justin Boyby can like flash a little bit. You feel okay. Like at best about this room, but definitely it's a concern. And I think it is something that they will address at some point in the season. Because yeah. if like if Morgan and Fox gets hurt, you have zero pass rushers in that in that interior room. And if Puna mm-hmm. Ford gets hurt, you have zero like capable run defenders that are proven. So uh I do think it is something that they could certainly yeah. address here in the next few weeks. And even Puna Ford, like he can hold his own, but he can't see where he's going because he's five eleven. <laughs> so in terms the of weirdest the body type. Defense, yeah. <laughs> I love Puna and I, I don't want to hate on him, but he's he's definitely faded away a little bit the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, all right, let's talk about the secondary. My my dream, I mean, you know I'm a big Derwin guy, um, but I have been a little underwhelmed by what we've seen from him basically since Brandon Staley ruined him. Um <laughs> my dream for him is the Kyle Hamilton role. Cause I just think, you know, obviously this is the Ravens inspired defense. Um, but I look at the safety room and I, I wonder how they might get there because if yeah. you're going to put him down into that slot position, I mean, you have Gilman is is kind of the do it all up and down guy, but they need a free safety. Um, I, I guess my is a two part question for you. Is there a chance we see Derwin in the just true Kyle Hamilton role and B, who could be the free safety in that situation? Is it JT Woods? Might they sign someone? There's still some guys out there. What do you think that safety room looks like? So for Derwin, I'll start with, uh, you know, last season, it was really funny because once they fired Brandon Staley, they put him in one specific role and he had his four best games of the season. Mm -hmm. And I think with Brandon Staley, like he came in with this idea, uh, he called it arming the defense around Derwin James which like sounded so cool. And he's like, Derwin James is going to play both safety spots. He's going to play the slot. He's going to play nickel backer. He's going to play dime backer. And he's going to play edge rusher for us. Like if you go back to 2021, he was legit playing like edge rusher, like yeah. setting the edge in a few games. That, And it was like so cool that somebody looked at Derwin James and said, hey, like maybe this guy can just play everywhere. Uh, 2021, they actually had him shadow CD Lamp. Like it was so cool, but I think it just became too much. Like you're asking Derwin James to play eight different positions. You're asking him to be your best cover guy, which he was. You're asking him to be your best run defender. Uh, 
your third best pass rusher, your best safety, your best, like it was too much. Like it, it was like, nobody can really do that. And I think even Kyle Hamilton would say, Hey man, like I'm not an edge rusher, like play me where I want to play. Right. Um, so Jesse Minter has talked about, we're going to have him be versatile, but in a simplified manner. So like maybe this one game, we might like his matchup uh, against the slot or this matchup against the tight end. Or maybe this one game we like him around the football playing the box more. Or maybe this one game he needs to play deep more depending on who you're playing. So mm -hmm. it's more of kind of a matchup thing, which I think is the right approach for Derwin. And you're just going to say, hey, like this week you're a box safety. This week you're a free safety. This week you're playing the slot. This week you're going to blitz 10 times. I don't know. Yeah. So I think that is going to get the better version of Derwin out there. And I still think like you see the glimpses of it over last season that that all pro best safety in the league is still in there. It just became, you know, such a, an untenable situation for him last year that uh, it led to his downfall. But I, I do firmly expect him to bounce back in 2024. Yeah. Um, they just signed Tony Jefferson out of retirement. I saw that, yep. which I think is an indication that they don't really trust the safety room outside of Alohi Gilman, who I think is one of the more under underrated players in the league for what it's worth. Yeah, I agree. But it's a major concern because JT Woods has played like a hundred regular season snaps. He had some mystery illness last season, which there was mm -hmm. never any clarification on. He was injured the year before that. Um, and then when he came back from the injury or from the illness last season, they were playing two undrafted free agents ahead of him. Uh, guys that are like good special teams players, AJ Finley and Raheem Lane. But it was a it was a big concern. And we were down there in training camp and you could tell that things were not just like clicking for him mentally. Like athletically, he's he's definitely got all the tools. Um, so I think their third safety is going to be Tony Jefferson coming out of retirement. He worked with the Ravens last year in the scouting office with Joe Ortiz. <laughs> Uh, and Joe's like, Hey man, you want to come out of retirement? So I really think he's the third guy. I think oh, that's crazy. Uh, <laughs> it is. And I think that's another position where it's like, Hey, uh, like next year we have money, we have draft picks. Maybe we go get somebody through the trade market. Um, but it really just, the chargers resources were, it was just not a scenario where they could go out and be aggressive and get a third safety in the draft or in free agency. But next year they probably can't. Yeah. Good breakdown. I like it. All right. Um, let's finish this up. We, you hinted at it early, but I don't think we got a clear answer. Um, the chargers over under is eight and a half this season. Mm -hmm. Would you gun to your head, go over or under on that? I'm putting you on the spot. I'm taking the over there. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the you know, strength of schedule based off of future mm -hmm. betting markets, they have one of the third easiest schedules in the league. Um, yeah. I think I'm safe. Like I safely think that they can get to nine wins and anything like, I think there is some upside for more depending on how much of like the Harbaugh effect really kind of matters with all of these question mark players that we're, we're talking about. Maybe like they're able to just get the best seasons out of all of these guys. I don't know, but I kind of doubt it, but you know, just reality speaking, but uh, over eight and a half to me is, is an easy decision because the schedule is just so so favorable to them um and then the end of the season schedule as well like their last four games are all very very winnable games to me so there's a really difficult stretch between weeks 10 and 14 where they have to play the ravens and the Bengals and i and somebody else that i'm forgetting right now um but i i think overall the schedule is easy enough for me to say justin herbert jim harbaugh easy schedule i, I think that's nine wins at minimum okay well, I'll be the Chargers hater, and I'll I'll bet you a sandwich <laughs> or a Chipotle or whatever we uh we can we can pick something. I'm gonna I'm gonna take the under this year, just under like seven or eight wins. I don't think they'll suck, but uh, I'm a, I'm a little bit lower. A little, I'm I'm just worried about the the spine of the defense. Some of the in like they have a lot of injury prone players. I was looking at yeah. this thing. I was like, man, they could really run out of talent quickly. So yeah. uh, I'll go against you on that one, and we'll see how it ages. Yeah. Uh, but, no, there's uh, there's a lot of upside with some of these guys, but like Christian Fulton is going to be their best cornerback this yeah. year. And he's got a ton of hamstring injuries, history mm -hmm. and kind of underwhelming football. But Jim Harbaugh thinks that Ben Herbert can cure any injured player. And honestly, like <laughs> I, I don't 
know if there's any reason to doubt him. Um, but we'll see how it goes. I mean, like DJ Chark as well. Hayden Hurst almost retired last year, and he's going to be their best receiving tight end. And I don't know, man. Like, it's just all over the roster with these injury questions. J.K. Dobbins has not played a full season since his rookie season, and he might be their best running back. I don't know. But uh, it's not like Herbert... the Chargers have ever had a history of injuries, Steven. That's never no, been a problem. No, but to be fair, they've <laughs> also never had a legitimate sports science department either. Yeah with a legitimate strength and conditioning coach. And they do have that now. So right. maybe Ben, Ben Herbert can just work some miracles over here. <clears throat> Love it. All right. It's a fun team. I can't wait to see where this goes. It's been a pleasure as always. Uh, everybody definitely follow the guilty as charged podcast. Um, anything else you want to say before we get out of here? No, uh, fun team. Always the chargers, you know, you're going to get some chaos. It happens every single year. Um, if you're not tuning into the Jim Harbaugh press conferences, I definitely would. Mm. They are hilarious. He is so great about never answering the questions, <clears throat> but also answering the questions at the same time. So uh, it's a good time, man. Justin, Justin Herbert, Jim Harbaugh. It's gonna be a good, it's gonna be a fun season. And then next year, when they have money and resources, it's gonna be great. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, thanks for your time, Steve. Thanks, Marcus. Appreciate it. Thank you, Stephen and the Guilty as Charged podcast for coming on yet again. It's a pleasure as always. And thank you to all of you for watching. This was a really fun one for me to do. I, I see a lot of upside in the Chargers' future with some uh, bumps in the road along the way this season, potentially. Um, but I hope you enjoyed the breakdown. Please do hit that like button on the way out if you did. Make sure you're subscribed as well. And until next time, peace out. We'll see you later. <laughs>